Okay, let's see. Testing, testing. Audio seems good. Okay. Anybody watching? We got somebody with a like, so that means someone is watching. Three concurrent viewers. Good, good. People are starting to show up apparently. Let me switch this from top chat to live chat. Okay, the modules are up. And I've enabled ultra low chat latency. So everybody should be able to living life says hello JC. Okay. We should be getting like the things very, very soon after they, you know, uh, like you're going to hear me with a very, very low latency. The gaffer is here, says hello, JC. Mouse girl is here, hello. Greg Appleby is here, hello. How are you? Okay, let me just move this over here a little bit. Okay, we got 11 concurrent viewers, five likes, which means Approximately six people watching are, you know, great old ones or Cthuloids. They don't like the thing. Uh, so Peggy Bradford is here, says hi JC and chat. Hello. Wolf is here. Hello, Wolf. Kano 83 says, hey JC, I was watching Resident Evil, hence the quick first like. Need more episodes? It's awesome. That is that's awesome, Kanos. Don't worry, more episodes are on the way. And if everything goes according to plan, even a little surprise, you know? CDP Mia says, the thing. Yes, exactly the thing. Okay, good. I guess we are going to start doing this. Kevin Frost is here saying hi all. Hello, Kevin. Welcome to the stream. I'm going to switch to big JC. So, hey guys, JC here playing Call of Cthulhu, Alone Against the Tide. This is a solitary adventure by the lakeshore. And we got a, a bunch of stuff that we need to check before we begin the adventure. The, uh, we're going to give some, some time for people to, to show up. Like over here, I have all of the Call of Cthulhu RPG books. This is the one we're going to use for the solo adventure because it's a simplified rule set. You know, book two of the introductory rules that come with the, with the starter kit which is all you need for these solo adventures, really. But I also have all of this. The Call of Cthulhu Keeper rulebook, which is similar to the Dungeons Master's book. You know, the Dungeons Master in, in D&D. This is the Call of Cthulhu Investigator Handbook, which correlates to the players, you know, guide in DND. And we got this. The Maleos Monstrosum. These things are like, you know, all of the monsters in the mythos. You see? But like, we're going to check this out in, in another stream. For now, we're just gonna play this adventure. This, like I said, this is a solo adventure. It's called Alone Against the Tide. You can get it at the PDF at uh, Chaosium's uh, website for like six bucks. You know, so it's pretty, pretty cheap. And Joe Satomi is here, says, howdy folks, hello. And Scott says, hey JC, just uh, ripping in Hellboy 2019 into the place when I got your notice. Looking forward to seeing you survive this game. I hope we survive, because if we play like we played the first session of Alone Against the, Fl the, the Flames, like a happy little squirrel, we're going to die. You know? uh, Wolf says, y you can play Resident Evil Village if you want JC or you can wait. Spoilers, Wolf, spoilers. Don't spoil my surprise. Mm -hmm. Don't spoil the surprise, but keep an eye on tomorrow's video. And Game Master Team Seahol is here. Hello. Hope you're as well. Yes. We're good, team. Welcome to the stream. CDP Mia says, if I saw an instruction booklet that said tutorial book number two, I'd give it up and fall asleep. Well, you gotta, you gotta play the, the RPG books, uh, bro. You gotta, you gotta read, you gotta learn the rules, you gotta play things. 
Game Master Team Seahome says, got drinks ready, ding, drink long, drink hard. Awesome. And Wolf continues to spoil tomorrow's video. So Wolf, zip it, zip it, you know? How is uh, the delay, you know, between what I'm reading? I, like I said, I set the stream for ultra low uh, delay so we can have a more fluid interaction when we have to take the, like the, the decisions, you know? Okay, let me just switch to this. Okay, so. Uh, Team Seahome says, not much, if any, delay. Good, good. So, this is the first thing that we have. As you can see, I have my chat. And uh, CDP Media says, rent master. Oh, yeah, Team Seahome. Yes, exactly. Wolf says, sorry for the spoilers. Yeah, but no more spoilers, mom. No, no, no more spoilers. You know, zip it, zip it. Living life has no delay here. Awesome. So as you can see, we got, let me just uh, get all of this thing. So we got Mighty Cthulhu and we add the webcam. And then we add the photo of our smiling investigator for this afternoon, this evening actually. And we got the chat, you see? So this is our victim, I mean investigator for this afternoon. If you, if you take a, a good look at his face, he's like, he's going like this. Like he knows he might die horribly because, well, that's what happens in Call of Cthulhu. And it, it, it's just like that. This is the, the module, you know, alone against the tide. Uh, and CDP Media says, I got my first ever drone today and I'm trying to set it up. That is awesome, CDP Media. You see, this is the module we're going to play. Alone against the tide. Solitary adventure by the lakeshore. Hmm? And this module comes. Jason says, hi, JC, watching an auction for a new use black hole 1979 coloring book that I'm about to win while watching your stream. Awesome. Awesome. Scott says, are you playing the investigator today? Or he has a beer with me. He will be hiding things. Exactly. You know, this investigator that you can see above me is the one we're playing. And this is his character sheet, which comes predetermined with the model. You can build your own investigator or you can use this one, which is already, you know, pre-built. His name is Ellery Woods. He's a professor and he has a beard, which means he is hiding things, you know. And T.C. Hill says, cool, CTP Media. Sounds fun. Yes, you know, the drones are all good and fun until you just, you know, like, crash them. <laughs> No, uh, you have fun with them, but, you know, be careful because they are a sizable investment. Be careful. Don't go like, you know, like zooming around canyons or whatever. And Michael says, yeah, boy, let's go. So, yeah, this is our character. And as you can see, it's an investigator. He has a strength of 50, a con of 60, size 50. So uh, in Call of Cthulhu, attributes go from, uh, you know, 1 to 100. So, for instance, in intelligence... 70, this guy is pretty intelligent, you know, it's above average. Education of 80, he is among the top edu educated, you see. Dexterity 60, not, not bad. Constitution 60, not bad as well. Strength 50, average. Size 50, average. Appearance 40, that's because of the beer. Because, you know, people with beers, they hide things, they have secrets. They've seen some stuff they're not telling you. So everybody you see someone with a beer, let it be known. They're hiding something. Okay. And over here we get the sanity. He's starting at 50. Magic points at 10. Hit points 11. The luck, we're going to have to draw it, you know. And this is our, you know, like miscellaneous investigator skills. And I read the beginning of the adventure and you, we, we got like a pool of 70 more points that we can allocate in this. You know? We don't have any weapons. CDP Mia says, I'm hoping to get into a bit more aside from Ghostbusters with you. Okay, good. Uh, weapons, if he's unarmed, these are the, the, the points. You know, we don't have any damage bonus in combat. We got a 15 dodge, which like I said, average. And this is a personal description. White man with heavily tanned skin, dark hair, brown eyes, short, neatly trimmed beard. But he's hiding things. 
wears a newsboy cap, which looks slightly at odds with his smartly tailored three-piece suit. Ideology believes fortune favors the prepared mind. Significant people, his other friends of the Boston Nine, Ellery might have left his days of crime behind him when he got his education, but you never really leave a gang. Oh, he used to be like in a gang when he was younger. Interesting, from Boston, you know. And Wolf says, would you get mad at me if I spoil it for you? Yes, I would. So, like I said, zip it. Completely zip it and watch tomorrow's video. Meaningful locations, Boston, the city that calls home. And stop mentioning Resident Evil, you're still spoiling it, Wolf. Treasure Possessions, the research manuscript he's been working on for over a year. Ellery hopes it will win him academic acclaim. Interesting. Traits says inquisitive, ambitious. Okay. Gear and possessions, we have a tailored three-piece suit, newsboy cap, thin briefcase containing a research manuscript, a change of underwear, and a few essential toiletries. Spending level is 50, we got 300 bucks in cash and 30,000 in assets. It's not bad, you know? Okay. So yeah, this is, like I said, our investigator. I can hide it and we can begin. Oh, before we begin, I want to show you uh, the, the dice, um, you know, trail I have, because since Twitter yesterday had like a big breakdown and um, not all functionalities are back. So I did a poll on Twitter and there's no votes and I did a little bit of research and yeah, polls are just broken at this point. So look at this. I'm going to show you. This is the dice cam. You see? So we got the three dice I have. These ones over here are the fancy metal dice. The problem is that with the reflections, they really don't look good, you know? I even have an additional light set up here and they, they, they don't look good. I would need more light or a better camera, which is like the one I'm getting. So for now, sadly, we are going to, uh, we're not going to use the metal dice because they're too hard to see. For you, I mean, I, I can see them perfectly. So I'm just going to put them in this fancy bag of holding they have. Okay, so those are off. And now we need to decide between these plastic ones, cheap ones, but very, very good visibility that came with the starter set, or these ones, which are official Call of Cthulhu dice. Well, let me show you. You see? Oh, it's inverted. Sorry. They are official Call of Cthulhu dice. And Scott says green and blue. And uh, the team says, I do like the green. I tend to agree, but remember those dice roll really, really bad in our original adventure. You know? So it's a shame, but for now, I agree, we're going to go with the, the cheap plastic ones that came with the starter set. And Joe says, JC, did you sink your dice? Demon dice are no joke. I know, Joe, I know. And I've kept these dice close to me, not exactly under my pillow, but close to me for a while. So I hope those dice have been exercised of the really crappy rolls we had in the first Call of Cthulhu session we did like a month and a half ago or whatever, you know. So let me just store this properly. And those are the dice we're going to use. And Jason says, I want the auction. That is really good. Michael says, you can't really see the other ones. Yes, yes. So these are the dice we're going to use. And this is good because these dice, they have two 100 dice for penalty or advantage.
These are the dice we're going to be using the most, you know? Like I said, Call of Cthulhu has a system. I'm gonna get rid of the dice cam. Has a system, it's, it's, it's actually pretty simple. Has a system based on uh, skills from uh, zero to 100. So, if you, for instance, have to perform a strength check, you need to roll 50 or less for a regular check, 25 or less for a hard check, and 10 or less for an extreme check. You see? Full value of your, of your uh, you know, characteristic, half and one quarter. And that's, that's pretty much most of the mechanic, you know? If you need to roll an education uh, check, regular one, 80 or less, you win. It's a, if it's a hard one, 40 or less, you win. And if it's an extremely hard one, 16 or less, you win. And also, sometimes, so less is, is, is better, you know, when rolling dice. And you can get advantage because you have, let me just go back to dice cam. You have this one, which is the units. And this one, which are the tens. So you roll with advantage. You roll two tens dice and you pick the, the one with the lower value. So that's what advantage. And you, if you roll with disadvantage, you roll two tens dice and you pick up the, the, the tens dice with the higher value. So disadvantage. Because you're always trying to beat... Uh, what the number is or less and that's pretty much it that's all we need to remember about how this works you know so without further ado let's start i'm just gonna hit this thing hey jason with the it's a it's a uh, stream elements paypal tips to celebrate my win now to see what other nerdy things i can find to bid on that is awesome thank you jason much appreciated just gonna go with this I have a new alert. I don't know if you noticed. It's like the black square that appears, and it's 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 looking pretty. You know, it's looking pretty. Uh, Michael, no, I don't have any settings. That's YouTube. I always set to I stream at 1080, 60 frames per second. YouTube decides based on their own shenanigans what is for you. You know, but I don't control that. What I do control is, like I said, that I set this stream to ultra low latency. So when we have something to talk about, uh, we are going to be able to have quick interactions with us. And as you can see on top, you can see the time it takes from when you type something in chat and it appears up there, you know, should be significantly lower than usual. They need to fix it. It only happens when you stream. Well, you can fix it. You know, you just select whatever you need. YouTube is not going to listen to me. Okay, people, let's do this. These monsters are not going to haunt themselves. So this is it. Call of Cthulhu alone against the tides. A solitary adventure back the lecture. I have a piece of paper because if you remember, we keep, we keep a little bit of tra track. Jason says, it's pretty fast response. Yes, you see? When you type, and it appears up there. That's when I'm seeing it. So we're going to have a, a more fluid communication. This is not a good setting for when I'm streaming like games because of the, the bit rate, you know? But for this thing, it's, it's awesome. And, and Scott Hassel says, boo, you know, terrifying. Michael says, hello to team. Okay, let's start this. So this appears to be some sort of monster, and I'm guessing we're going to be facing this jackass at some point. You have some sort of eldritch structures coming from a lake, you know, alone against the tide. So, let's see the introduction. Was testing the response time, sorry, says Scott. Oh, it's okay. The boo is from a uh, waste of loading, you know, when you, in one of the sections, you, 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 you found like messages left by ghosts. It was boo. It was terrifying. You know? Okay. So along against the tide, this is a solo adventure for the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. 
Unlike a standard game of Call of Cthulhu, this adventure requires no Keeper. Keeper is like the dungeon master, you know, in, in D&D. As it is a solo scenario. In fact, you are both the Keeper and the story main character. You can take on the role of an investigator of your own design, or if you will prefer one of the two ready-to-play investigators, Dr. Ellery Wood, page 80 is the, is the character sheet, which is the one I, I showed you, this one, and Dr. Eleanor Wood, which is like the same character, just only female version, you know. Depending on the investigator you play, your reasons for traveling to the quiet, affluent lakeside town in which the adventure is set may vary. The horrors your character experiences and how much of a mystery affecting Esbury you manage to solve depends on your choices throughout the game. These choices not only affect what happens to your investigator, but also the other people you meet along the way. For all its scenic beauty and charm, Esbury is a dangerous place and there is every chance that your investigator could die as the events of Alone Against the Tide unfold. Thankfully though, you can attempt this scenario as many times as you want to. You can also choose a different investigator or create a new one. Each time you play to help you explore the different challenges and pathways this story has to offer. So what are you waiting for? Esbury's fate is in your hand. Okay, we're gonna do this. So, uh, preparing to start. Make sure you have a copy of the Call of Cthulhu Keeper Rulebook 7th edition or the Call of Cthulhu Starter Set at hand. Like I said, I have the Keeper uh, Rulebook, but with the Starter Set is more than enough. Hey Ramming Speak, welcome to the stream. If you intend to use either Dr. Ellery Woods or Dr. Eleanor Woods, copy or print out the relevant, uh, relevant investigator sheet. If you would rather create your own investigator, copy, print, or download a blank investigator sheet and read the Getting Started section on page 5. Once you're done, you're ready to take on the challenges. Yes, we are. Getting started. So, before you begin play, you will need a set of role-playing dice. We have a pencil and an eraser. I have the, 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 the paper and the thing. As mentioned in preparing to start, you will also need a copy of either the Call of Cthulhu Keeper rulebook or a Call of Cthulhu starter set and your investigator sheet. We have the investigator sheet. This adventure is designed to lead you through the basic rules of character creation in Call of Cthulhu. Oh, we get a, 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 a tip. A, um, yes, cheers for some fun gaming by Game Master Team Seaholm. Thank you, Tim. Much appreciated. It allows us to buy the other things like this. You know? We already paid for the cost of this module. You know, and subsequent modules, and the cameras coming, all of the other things. So, if you're using a pre-generated investigator, just ignore the comments in the text about creating a new character. If you remember the last time we played Call of Cthulhu, uh, the, the starter set, Alone Against the Flames, as you progressed to, through the initial sections, you were completing like the, you know, the, the sheets, you know? Hey, Michael Velasquez with the super chat for the nerdy things. Thank you for always being cool. Thank you, Michael. Much appreciated. Thank you for the super chat. So, if you prefer not to create your own investigator, a male and female variants of the same ready-to-play character, Dr. E. Woods, is included at the end of this scenario. And like I said, Chaosum also kindly provides this PDF that you can download and has everything in, you know? Note that only certain skills have already been allocated points. You have a pool of 70 points, uh, bonus skill points, to spend on any skills for Dr. Woods. This can include increasing those skills already allocated points or choosing other skills to broaden out Dr. Woods' abilities. Just add the bonus skill points, divide it up however you wish, to the base skill values written next to the different skills on the investigator sheet. For example, as Dr. Woods has no skill points in jump, his base value is 20, as written next to the skill in the investigator sheet. If you allocate 10 of your bonus skill points to jump, it becomes 30. 20 plus 10. It is up to you to decide what skills to increase. As a guide, the following skills could be useful. Could be useful. Anthropology, appraise, archaeology, charm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write something because I'm going to decide this on my own. I'm going to put some in charm. Climb, fast talk, fighting. I'm going to put some in fighting, you know, because you tend to get into fights with this. Firearms, intimidate, jump, listen, locksmith, navigate, persuade, psychology, spot hidden. I'm going to put in spot hidden. Stealth, survival, and swim. 
I'm thinking since this is in a lake, we might need to swim a little bit. So I'm going to put in maybe stealth and swim. Okay, we need to allocate these 70 points. So I'm just going to go over here with the sheet. And if you take a look at this, investigator skills, we need to allocate 70 points on this. As you can see, archaeology is 70. Very high. Remember, skills go from 1 to 100. Credit rating 60 is good. Dodge 50. Um, so we got uh, accounting. Okay, the, the, the ghouls didn't appear. That's good. The fast talk, which was when you're trying to like con someone. Fighting brawl. This guy is pretty good at fighting, you know? But we're going to allocate 20 more points to this, you know? So this is going to be 65. And it calculates. So we use 20. We need to allocate 50 more. Firearms, no, we're not gonna do that. First aid, history, intimidate. Uh, no. Um, jump, language, Arabic language. Possibly we're going to fight like an original Necronomicon, you know, like manuscript, otherwise known as the Al Zif. Language on English. Law, library use, listen, locksmith. Locksmith 50 is pretty good. Mechanical repairs, medicine. Medicine is just bullcrap. Natural world, navigate, occult. Uh, operating heavy machinery, persuade. We could put something persuade. Psychology, psychoanalysis, right, science. Spot hidden 25. I'm going to allocate 20 spot hidden here. So this is going to be 45. So we use 20. And uh, team says like the ceilings, like the corner. Yes, you need to spot the hidden and check, you know. And um, okay, bye Wolf. So um, throw, track, swim. I'm going to put... I think, I think we need to... I, I did the charm. Charm, we're not very charming. We could try persuade, you know? No, persuade is 40, it's not bad. Swim. Let's go with 20 on swim. I'm gonna put 20 on swim for a grand total of 40. And we got 10 more points to allocate. And these 10 more points are going to be to um now locksmith is good fast talk is good let's just put them into i don't know psychology i, I wanted to put some in stealth i'm gonna put them in stealth for a grand total of 30. okay we allocated the, the um, yes, like Michael said, maybe stealth. What's natural world is just, is just general knowledge about the natural world, you know? And Evil Askes says charm. Yeah, yeah, but in the end I, I went, because you get charm and you get persuasion, you know? And we get a 40 in persuasion, which is pretty good actually. So we have allocated all 70 points to our character, you know? So we're good. Um, allocate the 70 bonus skill points whenever you want to. Of course, you'll have to pick which skills you think you're going to be useful. Yeah, that's part of the game. You won't have enough skill points to always pass your skill rolls, but that's where luck points can come in very handy. Using luck points, uh, page six. Yeah, we're going to do the thing with the luck, you know. They introduced this mechanic, which in, in a lot of Against the Flames, we, we didn't have that one. So let's just go over here. Reading this book. Yeah, I know how to read this book. You, you, it's like a choose your own adventure, but for Call of Cthulhu. A note about the rules. What I talk about, the bonus and penalty die. When you roll a 100, you roll an extra tense die. And if you have advantage, you take the one with the lowest value. And you, if you have like disadvantage or penalty, you take the one with the highest value. Combat, 
yeah, I know how to fight. We just roll against what it says in the book and then compare. If you roll less, you would fail. Oh, this is a thing that we didn't have in the Alone Against the Flames. You know, we didn't use the mechanic. Using luck points. You have certain luck points and you, what you can do is spend luck points in order to alter or, or, a, a result. For instance, if your skill is 50 and you roll a 54, ordinarily you would fail the roll. But if you spend four luck points, you can turn that failure into a success. And of course, if you go to zero luck, you die, you know? So this is a mechanic, like I said, that we did not use in the last one, luck points. So if we fail a roll and we have enough luck points, we can potentially revert that roll using the luck points. You know? Okay, and uh, we need to roll the luck points. We need to roll 3d6 and multiply the result by 5. So I'm going to do that. This is a d6. Regular standard die. So 5. 4. That's 9. And 6. Very, very good rolls. You know, 15. Okay, so, and we need to multiply that by 5. So, 15 times 5, it is 75. So, we go to our character sheet. And luck points. We got a lot of luck. 75. That is our starting luck. You know, so we can push rolls and any check that we do against our luck, it's a 75. So we got a 75% chance of succeeding. Very good. Very good. We're starting with the right foot. You know, the die have been, they've, they've been good. So, okay, there. Oh, I forgot to roll the dice cam, but you can see the last roll of the, of the cam. Sorry. Okay, so that's good. We got we got a good luck, uh, you know, number. Insanity, physical damage is not the only danger your investigator faces. Several encounters may challenge the sanity as well. Yes, the sanity we got, and um, we got. Let me see how many sanity points we got. Fifty sanity points. So we're good. We're good. There's like. If you, if you lose sanity points, that might lead to certain things in the regular Call of Cthulhu game, like I said here, they said here in Phobias or Manias. Here, you just follow the, 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 the book, you know? And it's a note about the entries, the entry numbers in large bold numerals, details describe the scene or briefly comment on the situation. After that, the entry might instruct you uh, to uh, go to a certain entry. Yes, the parenthesis number. Uh, this is interesting because they show you from which entry you came, you know, and occasionally you will, the, you will go to the end. So this helps with keeping track. Okay, people, this is it. Now we begin. Alone Against the Tide, a Call of Cthulhu adventure. Our story begins sometimes in the 1920s, on the pier opposite the lakeside resort town of Asbury, Massachusetts. Your investigators' reasons for visiting the town are discussed in the relevant entries. Hey Elvis, how are you? Welcome to the stream. Read through the introduction and get in starting sections and gather everything you need. We're good. Yes, Cthulhu. We're playing the Cthulhu, a new adventure, alone against the tide. When you're ready to begin playing, go to number one. We're going to uh, number one. CDP media says, fire the Hades cannon. Yeah, in this situation, I agree, you know? If you ask me, nuking the side from orbit is the only way to be sure. But sadly, in the 1920s, they didn't have orbital nukes. So, here we go. All right, this is a picture of what our investigator would have looked like if we've gone with the female option, which... If we die, we play. We might we might play as Doctor Elder Woods. Yeah. So, number one, the sun sinks low on the horizon as you board the ferry headed across the lake to Asbury. As you set foot on the boat, the ferryman greets you with a wide smile. He goes like this, and a cheery wave. He goes like this. Oh, by the way, here's Cthulhu. 
He stands by the gangplank as you pass, welcoming the other passengers as he removes his cap to scratch at his balding head. His pudgy figure fills his well-worn suit. He looks a little awkward, but he seems a rather pleasant sort. Leaving the man behind you, you take a seat towards the prow. Eyes fixed on your destination. Okay, so number one. And now we go to number 12. So like the, uh, like in the previous PDF we played, you just click here, boop, and you jump to number 12. So one, 12. Living Life says Hope, he is a better driver than the last. Well, we're in a boat, you know, so we might, we might crash into some sort of uh, water monster or something. I don't know. Number 12. You settle into a seat with your thin break briefcase resting on your lap, noticing that the rest of the passengers are likewise getting comfortable for the short trip across the lake. Glancing around, you catch sight of the ferryman entering the cabin. As you sit uh, patiently and wait for the engine to come to life, you listen to the sounds of idle chatter around you. You look out across the water and notice a thin fog beginning to form over the surface of the water as the temperature drops with the approach of night. You know, things are starting to get spooky. After a few minutes, you hear the engine sputter into action and feel the ferry uh, lurch forward. The conversation around you continues as the ferryman joins you all on deck. You can't help overhearing most of the talk, though it is surpris surprisingly banal. There are almost a, a dozen passengers on the ferry. Most of them are simply looking to spend their money during their weekend in Esbury and to enjoy the various shops and leisure activities the lakeside town has to offer. Many of the passengers seem to come from money, as it is common in Esbury. You notice a strange look from one of the women in the group. She has a full figure and brown hair and eyes. She seems to be looking you over, admiring your features. You know? And... Over here we got some instruction if you are creating our investigator, but we're not creating our investigator. If you're using the pre-generated investigator, Dr. Woods, take a look at how the characteristics have been assigned. The half and fifth values have already been calculated for you. If you need more information, uh, check the rulebook. And we already uh, you know, allocated the 70 points we had uh, to allocate, so now we go to 80. 80. The woman clearly sees something in you that she likes. It appears we're, get, we're, we're about to get lucky. Perhaps it's your looks or a glint of intelligence in your eyes. I don't know the looks, you know, because if you take a look at this guy, he looks like a bit of a jackass and he looks like this. But he has like a certain look of desperation in his eyes, you know. Also, the, the boy, the, like the, the news boy cap, uh, I'm not sure about that, you know, I'm not sure about that. But yeah, uh, but we're smart, you know, if, you, if we check the sheet, you can see that our, our intelligence is 70, our education is 80, you know. Our appearance is 40, so we're, you know, below average. Um, she gives you a sly wink, she goes like this before turning back to her companions. You likewise turn your attention to the rest of the passengers. And Scott says he looks like he's got a load in his pants and he's trying to hide it. Yeah, it could be, you know, he has like the, 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 the desperation look on his, on his face. That, that smile, it has a hint of desperation, you know? Um, sitting apart from the general crowd are two men in dark, well-tailored suits, whispering quietly, to each other. They have unamused expressions on their faces, as if they don't seem pleased to be here. Perhaps they are on business. Noticing that you're sitting alone, the ferryman approaches you and stands over you with his characteristic smile. It was like this. You notice he's missing a tooth, a, a tooth in the upper left corner of his mouth, because he, he got like a, you know, like the, the, the right hook Right, right legs here, and he's missing the tooth. Uh, his eyes are bright, and they light upon you. As they uh, are bright, as they light upon you. Good afternoon. You look a bit lonely here, friend. What brings you to Esbury? 
and over here the, you, you can like continue making you know like your character with suggested occupations and stuff but we already have a predetermined investigator you know so hey rerun is here uh yes it's going good rerun thank you if you are a professor or you have chosen to play dr woods go to 23 there are other alternatives you know you could have been an aquarium an author a dilettante a doctor of medicine a journalist police detective private investigator you know noble nichols or character in the last call of cthulhu or solo adventures would have been a private investigator but we're a professor you know so we're going to go to 23 23 you mentioned the passing of a distant colleague in Esbury and how you've been sent by Miss Ketonic, you know, that is Miss Ketonic University in Arkham, uh, which is like a, one of the typical uh, locations in, in Lovecraft's uh, work, um, to recover his book and bring it back to the university. If, in fact, if you look at my Twitter profile, you will see that the location is Miss Ketonic University, Arkham. The man sighs and nods slowly, slowly. You mean Professor Harris? Real shame what happened to him. Always seemed like such a nice man. Officer Powell says they're still cleaning up the mess at the professor's place. Oh, apparently the professor went squishy. You know, he, he ended up, when they walked into the, the scene of the, like, the crime, and he, they went like this. Because there were like pieces of the professor all over the place. So, monsters. Uh, they're still cleaning up the mess at the professor's place. But some of the more valuable bits will probably be at the estate sale tonight, if you're really wanting at it. The man looks down at his hands for a moment, and then back at you, as he extends one your way. Anyway, I'm Lance, Lance Sanford. Pleased to meet you. But I wish it were under better circumstances. So now we have our first choice. We could inquire about Professor Harris. We could inquire about Officer Powell. We can ask Lance Sanford about himself. We can ask about the estate sale, or we can just pass the time waiting to arrive in Esbury. So what do we do? Do we ask about Harris, about Powell, about Lance, about the sale, or we just wait? Just cast your you know what you think in chat scott is saying lance okay rerun says harris jason says about the sale mouse girl says harris team says about the estate sale so we got two sales two harris one lance michael says ask yes we're going to ask about something but what Okay, next one decides, or I'm going to, about the sale. Okay, three sale, we're going to go ask about the estate sale. We go to 66. So. The mention of an estate sale grabs uh, your interest, and you ask for more, some more information. Sanford obliges. Amelia Harris is selling off some of her late husband's collection. She could use the money and yeah joe the sale I, I think you might need to like uh you know update your stream because you seem to be like a half a minute behind the rest you know just press like or reload because you know i'm using ultra low latency chat supposedly um amelia harris is selling off some of her late husband's collection she could use the money and doesn't really have an interest in that ancient Indian stuff that Professor Stewart studied. But some folks do. Collectors, acad academics, that sort of thing. She put the word out not long after her husband died. People have been uh, trickling, in for it, uh, uh, trickling in for the past few days. If you're looking for uh, to get your hands on something, it's going on tonight at the dance hall by the pier. You exchange a few more pleasantries with Sanford before he goes off to finish guiding the boat into port. You pass the time in casual conversation with the other passengers and in observing the scenery. You note the tall pines and the sloping hills along the lakeshore around Esbury. These features and the small town beyond are just visible through the growing mist, 
but squinting helps make them out to your satisfaction. In time, you arrive on the pier at Esbury, grateful to be off the water. So we know there's a sail tonight by the pier. That is important to know. So I'm going to just write it down like in my notes. Sail tonight by the pier. We're going to go to three. Three. You take your first steps onto the pier with the rest of the ferry passengers, trying to get your land legs once again. The passengers still chat casually as they walk off to their destinations. You note one last little flirty wink from the full figure woman, she goes like this, as she struts along, confidently behind the women accompanying her. Um, as she struts along confidently behind the women accompanied her. And you feel the two dark suited men push past you at a brisk pace, nudging you out of the way. Sanford gives you one last wave and a smile as he begins tending to the old rust stained boat that is his pride and joy. The last light of the sun is fading fast and the fog is growing thick on the water now. The night is still young but you would rather not be wandering around in the dark and fog of a town you are unfamiliar with. And Jason said, how rude. Yes, you know, they just pushed past you. It was, it was just not, not, not a good thing. Yeah? Um, taking in your surroundings, you see a sizable crowd jockering for entrance into a lavish, modern-looking building along the lakeside. CDP Media says, charge my stick. Not yet. Not yet, CDP Media. Soon. A folding side sits out front, illuminated by a lantern. The words, estate sale tonight, are written on it in large, bold letters. While this seems to be the main attraction, you could also seek out somewhere to stay for the night and set about your work in the morning. If you have not done so already, calculate your secondary attributes as per page. Okay, we did it. So, but now we need to uh, make a decision. We can go and visit the estate sale, or we can just go and find somewhere to sleep. So what do we do? Jason said that would be a salt. Yes. So what do we do? We go to the estate sale, or we go find a place to stay for the night. Jason says sale. Tim says sale, sale, sale. Sale. Okay, we go to the state sale. We go to 15. Hey, Yellow Tiger, how are you? So, 15. Yes, Joe. S sale. 15. Pushing through the crowd, you make your way towards the estate sale. Judging by the number of people packing in the dance hall, uh, this seems to be quite the event. Most of the people here are well-dressed, with conspicuous amounts of jewelry and designer clothing on display. You see a broad-shouldered man in a policeman uniform standing by the door. He has a scarred, yet clean-shaven face and a baton at his side. He is about to go charge my stick if someone, you know, messes up the thing. Jason says, everybody's got money to burn. Yes. Um, he has a scarred, yet clean-shaven face and a baton at his side. His brow is furred in a serious expression, and he watches the commotion through narrow eyes. He's going like this. And he has a stick, you know. He's going to hit someone and says, charge my stick! As you mingle with the assorted academics and collectors, you notice a few other faces that stand out in the crowd. Most immediately, you spot a man in flowing orange robes with tawny skin. Let me just switch this a little bit over here because it's easier to read this and have the character sheet on this side. Okay, so. He seems more than a little out of place and garnering some old looks from the other gu uh, guests. I'm guessing it's this guy, you know? He, he, he has his like the smile. He's going like this guy. Um, glancing around further, you happen to notice the two dark-suited uh, uh, gentlemen from earlier, you know? We're gonna call them the man in black, the MIB, you know? 
they are protecting Earth from the scum, scum of the universe. So we got basically two MIBs in one corner. We got a guy who's going to charge my stick if someone just, just goes bananas. And we had this guy with weird outfit. He looks like a monk, you know? Maybe like a Buddhist monk or something like that? I don't know. Um, so yeah, we glance around further. We notice the two MIBs um, uh, from earlier standing in the corner towards the front of the, of the room. Talking to a young, dark, dark-haired man in a dated yet elegant long coat. He fancy, you know? He's fancy. He is of a slight build and has rather sharp features. A thin wisp of a mustache hangs beneath his nose. He looks like this. Most noticeable, though, is the rather attractive young woman standing on stage in, at the front of the room next to a bespectable... Uh, bespectable... 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 Well, a man with spectacles. Old man, you know? And Jason says, oh great, Hare Krishna, yes. Long black hair cascades down her shoulders, accentuating her pale features and complementing her formal black uh, dress. Occasionally, she and the older gentleman peek at objects hidden beneath white sheets, the sole items waiting to be displayed. Okay, so, um, what do we do? Let me see if there's more over here, no. We can mingle with the crowd of guests. We can speak to the officer at the back of, back of the room. We can approach the man in orange, which according to the picture is called Banyu. We can introduce ourselves to the dark suited man. We can make our way towards the stage and, uh, and the, you know, the attractive black haired woman. And we can leave the hall and go find a place to sleep. So these are the options. We can mingle. We can talk to the officer. We can talk to the man in orange. We can talk to the MIB. We can go to the woman or we can leave. Michael says woman. Kenny says JC, woohoo. Rerun says man in orange, man in orange, officer, officer. We got two men in orange, two officers. Man in orange, three men in orange. Let's see what the next one says. You know, this guy has like a friendly thing. Officer, okay. We got three officers and three men in orange. And one to the woman at, in the front. Another officer, okay. Another, okay, I, I guess we're gonna go talk to the officer. So we go to 88. 88. We're gonna go to the guy with the charge my stick. 88. You turn around and backtrack towards the entrance of the ballroom. Something about the officer by the door catches your attention and holds it. He gives off a commanding presence and his eyes bore into you intensely as you make your way over to him. He's looking at you like this. As you move within earshot and Kenny has to go to work. Have a great day. Okay, have a good one, Kenny. Don't worry, the stream is going to be up in its entirety as soon as YouTube is done processing. Uh, so as you move within earshot, he rests his hands on his baton and clears his throat. He's ready to go charge my stick, you know? He says, uh, see, uh, oh, uh, yeah, rerun says later to, to Kenny. I really hope there isn't going to be any sort of problem, citizen. I wouldn't want to see anyone getting hurt tonight. He, his hand does not move from his baton. We need to make a psychology check. Okay, so we're going to do a psychology check. So our psychology is uh, 50. So we need to do 50 or less. So, okay, dice cam. Here we go. Okay, people.
Okay, 89, so we failed the psychology check. Apparently those dice are kind of still a little bit haunted. So, we failed the psychology check. We go to 29. And we run and said, what, 89? Well, we failed, you know, <laughs> we failed. And Scott says, he's going to beat your ass. Yeah, most likely. The officer seems rather alert and vigilant. It would probably be best not to bother him and let him do his job. He clearly does not need or want your help in any way. So we go to 17. <laughs> and uh, and Rerun says, Lord, I thought we bet it. No, no, you need to roll the same number in your character sheet or less in order to, you know, like succeed. 17. 17. Cue the happy squirrel, says Mouse Girl. Oh, we need to make more interactions, you know? So 17, you have begun gathering information in Esbury. Would you like to interact some more? Yes, I would like to interact some more. You may now select another option from those listed. Do not repeat the choice already selected. Once you have chosen three options from the list below or before, if you're ready to move on, go to 35. Okay, good. So we, need, we have three choices. We have already used one, you know? So what do we know? What do we want to do now? We want to mingle. We want to talk to the man in orange. MIB. Go to the the woman at the stage, or just go or, or leave. Those are options, you know. Man in orange, woman mingle orange. Okay, orange. We got three orange. Orange. Okay, orange. It is. So, we're going to go talk to the men in orange. 102. You approach the strange man. He seems well-traveled and weary. Yes, Brandon, thank you. Uh, you might want to try to like check your stream. You might be a few seconds behind. Everybody, if you notice that... Uh, uh, well, as you can see, the chat up there with ultra low latency should tell you when you type it should be like like no more than a few seconds until it appears up there you know so so that way you can ascertain if you need to reload the stream or maybe in youtube press the the part that says live in order to just be like in the in, in men oh brandon says i just voted late i was low okay it's okay just but general advice, you know, because like I said, this stream is be, has been set to ultra low latency. You can you can check it out by saying when you what you type, how you know how fast it appears up there. Yeah. You know? Okay, so you approach the strange man. He seems well traveled and weary, and his long orange robes are a stark contrast to the fine suits and dresses of the New England financial elite. He seems decidedly out of place. You open your mouth as if to speak and find him staring intensely as you, at you. So you go like this and he's like this. We need to make an anthropology roll. Okay, anthropology roll. So an anthropology roll would be, we got a 60. Okay, we got 60% chance. Yeah. Let's go to the dice cam. We need a 60 or less. Five. Extreme success. Extreme success. So good. Let me get rid of this and get rid of this. So we did an extreme success. 72. Seventy two. Hopefully he's not doing well with those mute monks all. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. Yellow tiger class, sweet, yeah, yes. So, 72. You recognize the man's style of dress to be one of, of a Buddhist monk. Well, he was a Buddhist monk, you know. You bow a customary greeting, you go like this, to which the monk smiles and returns the gesture. 
before speaking in heavily accented but fluent English. It is good to see one here with such respect for our customs. I am Banyu. His expression turns to a frown, uh, to a frown as he makes a sweeping gesture to the rest of the room. The rest here seem only to seek to profit from my culture. Selling the items of my ancestors is most shameful. You respectfully question why he would come such a long way to witness such a thing, and he sighs before turning back uh, to you. I have come with what money my temple could gather, so I might save a certain few of the artifacts. One that your professor Harry stole from my temple in Sarnath when he came to visit some years ago. The monk seems troubled and falls silent. He bows a farewell, and you take the cue to leave. Go to 17. Okay, good. We got some good information this time, you know? So apparently the, our professor was some sort of a tomb raider or something like that. I don't know. Okay, now we're back here and we need to do our final choice, you know? No, no, I meant he, he probably meant your professor as a generic, you know, your professor. So uh, we can mingle with the crowd of guests, we can go to the MIBs, we can go towards the woman on stage, or we can leave. So what, what do we do? Mingle, uh, MIB, woman, or leave? Woman, woman, MIB, woman, MIB, woman, okay, woman is uh, one. We got two of my B, but woman is, uh, has four. Okay, we're gonna go talk to the woman at the stage. And there was an MIB and another woman, so we're going to go to the woman. But no, th this is not the same woman that winked at us in the in the ferry. You know, she she she's a different. Uh, you know, like a person. Okay, so we go to twenty-two. You make your way to the stage, navigating around the many guests in the dance hall. Your eyes look firmly on the woman, and hers rise to meet yours as she looks up from picking at one of the hidden objects. She stops what she's doing as you approach, and a smile appears on her lips as she notices that she's caught your eye. She rests her left hand on her hip as you come to stand at the foot of the stage. The old man behind her continues his inspections, either unaware or uncaring that you've come to distract them. The woman leans over you over the edge of the stage. Uh, the woman leans towards you uh, over the edge of the stage. You can see her makeup has been painstakingly applied, despite her status as a recent widow. Oh, she, she is the late professor's wife. She, she breathes through her eyes. No, no, that, that's from MIB. Okay, so this is the widow, you know, the, this is the, yeah, the, the, this is, was the wife of, uh, of the professor. So you clear your throat as you meet her gaze and promptly introduce yourself. She extends her hands to you formally. Well, aren't you in a face in town, she teases. We get those quite a bit here. No doubt you plan to beat on some of my late husband's things. Good for both of us, I say. Just be sure to give a good prize for little old me, all right? She winks slightly at you. And Brandon says, Widow, time to make your move, JC. You know? And, and she, she winked at me, but it's weird. But I'm pretty sure she's not the same woman from the ferry. I don't know, we're just gonna keep going. She's well made up and flirty. She's definitely one I steer clear of, says Scott. And Jason says, you can probably see more than just her makeup if she bends towards you. Jason, this is a family stream. Don't, don't say those things. <laughs> But yeah. Um, uh, where was I? Okay. You realize now would be a good time to get some more information from this woman. <laughs> Jason says, lol, sorry. It's okay. She killed her husband. Be careful, says living life. Yeah, I don't know. Well... 
uh, yeah, a Call of Cthulhu couldn't be like a family stream because it would pay, I hope you, you know, like you, you need to introduce your children to the horror mysteries of Lovecraft, but when they are teenagers, you know, don't introduce cosmic horror to children because they're going to go bananas. Hey, Bilal is here. JC couldn't help but laugh at Lal. Yes. She ate her husband, says CDP Media. Could be. We're throwing like theories right now, you know? Some people are, are putting up some hypotheses of what happened, you know? And Brandon says he means her tentacles, you perverts. Oh, okay, Jason, you meant her tentacles. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's more, you know, like it's normal. Everybody has tentacles in a Lovecraft tale. Uh, and Scott says he enjoyed it. Well, we are derailing this <laughs> this this uh, this tale now. So um, you realize now it would be a good time to get some more information from this woman who might be the the most well informed regarding your interest. She certainly seems like the flirty sort and would probably respond well to some of the same. We're gonna do a charm roll. If I succeed, go to 43. If I fail, go to 57. Okay, I think charm is one of the things that we did not increase. Let me just pull up the sheet. Charm. Oh, crap. Our charm is 15. Damn. So we get a 15% chance. Let's go to the dice cam. Let's see what Lady Luck determines. Come on, people. Big money. We need a 15 or less. Fifty-four, so we failed. We we failed, yeah. CDP Mia says over oh, champ to go 69. No, you need to go 15 or less. Not surprising, you are very charming with that smile. Yeah, you know, this guy's smile, he's like a, he's about to poop. So it was not good. Okay, so dice cam goes away, sheet goes away. We failed our charm roll, which, well, to be honest, it was a very extreme, 15, you know? Hey, Charles, how are you? Welcome to the stream. So we failed the charm, we go to 57. You manage a smile and stumble through a compliment and the woman laughs, you know? We manage this smile, you see? This smile. So she laughed at us, you know? Michael says he's hiding something with the beer. Yes, he's hiding the fact that he needs to go to the puppetorium or something like that. Yes, we run poop face, exactly. So she says, oh my, well, aren't you the nervous sort? Yeah, she's flirty, good. Even though we have like the I need to poop face, she's amicable towards us. Don't know what to say to a pretty woman like me, huh? That's quite all right. I wouldn't have you... <laughs> what? I wouldn't have you anyway? Wow, that was brutal. Denied. Denied. <laughs> You're welcome to stay for the sale, though. I might like you better as a buyer. Okay. She winks and turns around, walking back to her place on the stage. Yeah, well, that was denied, you know, so <laughs> good. Yeah, Evil Essex is ouch. <laughs> okay, we go to 17. You have begun gathering information in Esbury. We already did the three investigations we were allowed. So we now uh, need to go to 35. Oh, this is not linked. Oh, weird. 35 then. 35, 35, 35. Here we go. Denied. Hey, Marion. How are you? Welcome to the stream. We're playing Call of Cthulhu, a solo adventure alone against the tide. In case you're just joining, the over here we have our investigator, you know. He is a professor. Um, he has like a face like he is holding a poop or something like that. Chat is on top. The model is in this direction, like over there. This is our character sheet. Let me just go back to the top so you can see. 
This is our attributes. This is the dice cam. So, 35. The murmuring of the crowd dies down, and people begin to gather around the stage, as Amelia and the older gentleman call everyone to attention. The widow strides confidently to the front of the stage, where the lights are centered. She flashes a broad smile at the crowd and begins to speak. Good evening, everyone. Uh, and Jason says, like the ACDC song, shut down in flames. Yeah, that was brutal. Absolutely brutal. Good evening, everyone. I am so glad you all could make it tonight. As uh, you all know, my husband recently passed. And, uh, well, at this point, Amelia begins to tear up theatrically. So much that her makeup begins to smear. She produces a handkerchief to dry her eyes before continuing. And Michael says, uh, you can change the stream elements saying for what game you're playing so it makes sense. Uh, I don't know what to tell you, my, uh, Michael. I, um, it's YouTube. You know? it, 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 it is updated. If I look at my, I might think it says Call of Cthulhu RPG. So YouTube, nothing I can do. Uh, she produces a handkerchief to dry her eyes before continuing. Well, I'm very upset. I miss my poor William very much, and I don't know what I'll do without him. And that's why I brought you all here tonight. I hope you can find some use for this collection, and I know that he would be happy to see his things go to those who value them highly. I hope you'll show this poor widow a kindness by finding something you like. But now, let us begin. I'll leave the auctioning to Mr. Warren. With her opening statement complete, Emilian moves to stage, uh, to stage left and allows the bespectacled old man, presumably Mr. Warren, to take center stage. He clears his throat before speaking. Tonight, we have six very ancient and very valuable items and, as a side note, possibly very dangerous, at least one of them, um, very valuable items for sale from the estate of Professor William Harris. Though exceedingly rare, I have deemed these items to be authentic to the best of my ability. I have placed a ballot box, slips of paper, and a pencil on each of the six tables, next to the items for sale. If you wish to bid on an item, simply write your name and the amount you are willing to pay for it on a slip, then place it on the box. Oh, it's a, it's a blind auction. Um, I think this is called a Dutch auction, I believe. Someone, If someone knows, they can correct me. But it is a blind auction. Yeah. The item will be sold to the highest bidder. All of the proceeds will go to the wife of the deceased. With that, Mr. Warren moves to reveal the gather items. Go to 70. Seventy. Mr. Warren approaches the first table and removes the cloth covering the reveal uh, uh, the, and, and removes the cloth covering to reveal an odd pair of clay cylinders covered with strange etchings. They are small and seem quite fragile, with large chunks running down their sides. Uh, Mr. Warren proceeds to the next table and likewise uncovers the items in question. CDP Mia says no 69. No, it's 70, bro. 70. Just wait a little bit. We might hit 69 at some point. And at which point I will say nice. Uh, okay, so we got a couple of clay cylinders. Weird. Mr. Warren proceeds to the next table and likewise uncovers the item in question. This one is significantly, significantly larger and more ornate. It appears to be some sort of altar or reliquary heavily decorated with yellow-green gemstones. However, there is one similarity with the first item, the presence of the same strange written characters, though this one seems to have been painted on. Okay, so it's like a small altar or something. The old scholar turns to the next item in question and displays it for all to see, a decorated crown of solid bronze, wrought with the image of a Hindu god. Hmm, okay. 
The next item is certainly the most mundane, a large, thick, leather-bound journal that appears well-born and beaten, with several loose pages jammed between the pages, with several loose papers jammed between the pages. Mr. Warren senses the confusion of some members of the crowd and clarifies that the notebook is the assembled personal work and studies of Professor Harris. I believe that could be the most interesting to us, potentially the most revealing and also maybe the most dangerous, you know, because of the secrets. And since we have a beard with this character, we keep secrets. The item that follows the journal is a well-preserved ceremonial robe of Brahmin priest. The cloth is white pure. Okay. Um, maybe that Buddhist monk is for is for that. Well, I don't think so. I don't think they would just like. Uh, hey, balls to Cthulhu, tip twenty, and they say nothing. Okay, thank you, thank you to anybody that did that. I'm thinking. Is that you, Paul? Are you lurking in chat? That sounds like Paul. Hey, Paul says hello. Yes, it was Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Welcome to the stream. We're playing Call of Cthulhu, you know? So thank you. Thank you very much. It allows to buy the nerdy things. And these things, for instance. This, I bought it with the money from the donations. And Paul says, no, lol. Yeah, I'm on to you, bro. I'm on to you. Okay, so there's a ceremonial robe, and the last item is perhaps the strangest of all. It is a small statue or idol, uh, presumably of one of the many deities of ancient India, made from a blue-green stone in the shape of a rather grotesque lizard-like creature. The craftsmanship is crude and gaudy, and much of that it appears fake. People begin moving among the items, looking them over and conversing quietly. A small statue or idol, presumably of one of the many deities of ancient India, made from a blue-green stone in the shape of a rather grotesque, lizard-like creature. If this creature has, like, the tentacles, you know who it is. Or it might be the creature we saw, like, in the, you know, in the cover. Like this one. You see? This one. I don't know. We will see. So, we were at 70. Um, so, like I said, we have a couple of cylinders. And Paul says, uh, Paul, uh, I mean, Joe, Joe says, Paul lurking in the shadows with the nameless horrors, rolling dice and laughing at JC. Yes, it could happen like that. But, but also, he's tipping, you know, with the papal, so it's all good. We... We don't mind his lurking in the shadows, you know, with the old ones. So, um, we got a couple of cylinders. We got like the small altar. We got the, the, the writings, you know, the personal journal. We got um, the crown, the bronze crown. We got like the rope and we got this weird like idol. We need to make either an appraise or archaeology roll. So let me check with my uh, sheet, my character sheet, what is our best option. Appraise, we have 5%, so that sucks. Archaeology, we have 70, so we have a 70% chance of success. We're going to go with archaeology. So dice cam and we roll. We're looking for a 70 or less 70 or less come on big money 23 we succeeded <laughs> Paul says I was trying to think of a clever name not creative tonight you can say you could have said Cthulhu it would be good so we succeeded and we were, it was like a hard success you know so good so dice cam goes away Character sheet goes away, and we succeeded. So we're going to go to, yes, success, exactly. We're going to go to 45.
45. You examine the items with the trained eye. This one, you know, this is the trained eye, not this one, this one. Uh, and Paul says, elbow cuff. Oh, like this. Nice. That, that's also like a, a dab, you know? But weirdly enough, you can, in, in the chat, it says elbow cuff. I don't think... I saw something about uh, emojis. I think I need to... Those ones activate. I don't know. I'm going to check that in, in Streamlabs. You know? But yeah, it's like this. You examine the items with the trained eye, which, like I said, is this one is the trained one. The crown and ceremonial robe are obviously authentic and typical of what you would expect. They are in great condition and would certainly, certainly fetch a good price, though they are no rarer than any other antiquity. Okay, so that, those one discarded. Likewise, Professor Harris' journal seems like it would be of value to a scholar, though a few delicate cursory page turns show it contains personal accounts and tra uh, travel logs, as well as history, uh, historically relevant information. This is likely a good source of information on Professor Harris himself. Okay, that's good. However, the other items are present are noticeably different. The altar and clay cylinder, um, nothing succeeds like, like a parakeet with no teeth. Okay, you're like this. Yes, good. Um, uh, the altar and clay cylinders bear a, a similar script, and both show comparable signs of aging and wear. Given this, they are unlikely to be fabrications, but they are unlikely more traditional finds from ancient in India. A close inspection of the lizard idol, idol leads you to believe it is likewise verifiable, ver verifiably authentic. Though the workmanship is strange and unnatural, and clearly nothing like anything you've seen from ancient India or elsewhere, doesn't bear any signs of work from modern tools or influence from modern styles either. We we'll go to 81. No, no, Paul, this is the train eye for, you know, archaeology. This one is the one we use to shoot at the monsters, you know, so they have different purposes. So 81. You notice that you're not the only one looking over the items with such interest. The monk appears to be closely scrutinizing the stranger items as well, and the dark-suited gentleman, the MIB, from earlier seem to have taken a liking to the curious idol. Hmm. Apart from this, various other guests wander around the tables, occasionally fixing it on one in particular. There are many guests and a fair number of bids being placed. If you would like to bid on any of the items, now is the time. You will be redirected to this entry after each choice and you may choose to bid on any number of items. Please make each choice only once. And please note that each successful bid will lower your credit rating for future bids. Okay, okay, okay. We get a good credit rating, you know. To bid on the clay cylinders, on the altar, on the crown, on the journal, on the ceremonial robe, on the strange item. If you're unable or do not wish to bid on the any further items, go to okay. Yeah. Uh, I would like to bid first. I'm thinking on the journal. Well, let's let's recap. Yeah, uh, people are saying journal, but just just wait a second. Just wait a second. The robe and the crown, I think they are just like common things, so uh, we, we might not bid on that. I think we might bid on the journal and the altar and maybe on the clay cylinders. People are saying journal, journal, journal. What do you say we bid on? I'm saying journal. First we bid on the journal, that would give us the info, you know? Jason says journal, Scott says journal. Okay, we're gonna bid on the journal first, okay? Yes, Mouse Girl says journal, Living Life says journal, okay. We're gonna bid on the journal, go to six. Six. 
You feel that the information in the journal is essential to your interest and you cannot help but make a bid. You place your paper with the others and hope that Mr. Mr. Warren calls your name when the amounts are compared. Make an appraise or credit rating roll. If you succeed, go to this. Okay. So, no wonder he bumped with the lady, look in his eyes, one wants to kill, the other is only looking for things of antiquity. Yes, this, this is the one trained for, you know, like uh, appraising, and this is the one for shooting. So, we, well, I don't know. Okay, let's see our character sheet. So, we could do an appraise or credit rating. Appraise is 0, 05, credit rating is 60. So, we're going to have to go with credit rating. Okay. Credit rating, it is. So, let's go to the dice cam. We need to roll a 60 or less. Here we go. Big money, people. Big money. Scott says, this is going to go well, JC. Better luck with the dice. We, we, we've succeeded in a couple of things. Okay, so 60 or less. This is a 66, but I will use lock points. I'm going to push this to 60, you know? Remember that mechanic we showed at the start of the stream? Let me just hide this. We have 75 lock points. Yeah, the Scott saying the lock points, yes. So we're going to use six lock points. You know, we're going to use six lock points in order to uh, succeed at this roll. So that puts us, and Paul says, I got my new tennis today from Amazon. He looks amazing. Pictures later on Twitter. That is awesome. That is awesome, uh, Paul. So that puts us as, at 69 lock points. Nice. So we use our lock points. We won that roll. 69 lock points left. Nice. And now we take this away and we succeed. Go to 100. Okay. 100. You feel that the knowledge in these pages and CDP Mia says nice and rerun says nice. Yes. You feel that the knowledge in these pages could very well prove essential to you. So you offer a prize that is more than fair. Sure enough, Mr. Warren calls your name and presses the leather-bound tom into your eager hands. Boom, you know. Reduce your credit rating by two percentiles. Okay. So, our credit rating, it's 60. Now it's going to be 58. There we go. Go to 81. Okay, we go to 81. We got the journal, you know, and actually I'm going to, sorry, I'm just going to go over here and I'm going to write on my character sheet that we have journal. There we go. Sheet. Let's go here. Tech 49 says, hi, just stopping in. Later I realized this is like D&D. Hi, everyone. Yes, this is called Cthulhu RPG, a solo adventure. You know, it works like a choose your own adventure book. And we're doing the things. So we got the journal. Good job, people. Good job. So what do we do now? We could bid on the clay cylinders, on the crown. Like, like I said, I'm, I wouldn't bid on the crown or the robe we could we should go to the strange idol cdp media says it's a good sheet yes it's a good character sheet scott says strange idol or altar can't decide which would be better well the altar and the clay cylinders are interesting but the strange idol it appears to be weird you know idol 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 i agree idol okay people Let's be on the strange idol. We go to 92. 
Something draws you to the curious idol, and you feel compelled to make a bid. You notice that you're not alone in this, as the monk and one of the dark-suited men both place bids on the, of their own into the box. Okay, so uh, the, the monk we, we met and the, guy, the MIBs, they also bid, you know? You hope that yours is high enough. Make an appraise of credit rating roll, both at extreme difficulty. Wow. Succeed only at equal or two or below one fifth of the skill value. If you succeed, go to 86. If you fail, go to... Okay, this is going to be a credit. If you win, give it to the monk. I don't know, maybe the, the, game, the, the, the book allows me or no. But it is an extreme success, you know? Damn. Yeah, extreme difficulty. So, character sheet indicates that our credit rating... An extreme success is 11. Okay, let's go to the dice camp. We got an 11% chance, you know? I don't know. Oh, I don't need to take this. Okay, people. 11. We're looking for an 11 or less. Extreme difficulty. It was a 22. It was a 22. We still have a lot of lock points. You know? In order to get to 11, we would have to spend 11 lock points. Brandon says use lock. Hmm. Scott says this was a stream and it might be worth the luck points I would got for you. Okay. Okay. We're going to do it. We're going to use our luck points. So our luck now is at 58. We're using 11 luck points. 58. There we go. Might be worth it. Yes, yes. Jason says YOLO. I agree. YOLO. We are at 58 lock, which is still pretty good, you know, above average. Tech 49 says, so it is the closer to 11, the better, or does it have to land on 11? 11 or less. You know, you have your 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 skills and your uh, all of your stats. When you roll against them, they are on a percentile. So you need to roll the number or less. Extreme newbie here. Oh, yeah, well... Let me just show you this. As you can see, credit rating is 58. So for a standard check, you need to roll a 58 or less. For a hard check, 29 or less. And for an extremely difficult check, 11 or less. And you have lock points, which you can use to modify your rolls. But lock, if you run out of lock, you die. And sometimes you have to roll, you know, lock checks. So. It's also not a good idea to be, you know, out of luck. Okay. It's called an under-roll system. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Joe. So we succeeded. Um, it was 92. If you succeed, go to 86. 86. Paul says, sorry, had some technical difficulties. Daughter made lasagna and wife picked up a brisket. Interesting dinner. Well, lasagna is delicious and moist. Well, it is delicious and moist. Um, don't be frivolous with luck. Yes, but luck is important. Clearly, none of the others expected anyone to pay such a ludicrous price for the crude idol. You still can't believe how much money you offered for it. But the grotesque and misshaping thing is now yours. The monk and the men in dark suits, MIB, stare daggers at you. But nobody else seems to mind or take much notice beyond a few raised eyebrows that anyone would pay such an excessive amount for such a trifling and outlandish thing. Still, when you look Amelia's way, 
you can tell she is quite pleased. She's go, she goes like this. You see? Reduce your credit rating by 10 percentiles. Damn. Okay, my credit rating is now 48. We're getting poor. Okay, I reduce. Just so you know the character sheet. I reduce it to 48, you see? Okay. Evil Asker says, uh, those guys hate you now. Yes, they don't like me. We go to 81 now. Okay. So, we have the journal and we have the strange idol. Now we need to decide if we bid on anything else or if we just go. I would recommend against bidding on the ceremonial robe or on the crown, you know. Clay cylinders, altar. Do you need to add the item to the list? Oh yeah, good point. I'm going to add the item to the list. Good point. So, I'm going to add here a strange idol. Okay, we got it. Good, good point. Uh, get the character sheet out of here. Uh, Chris Murphy says, this is awesome. You do this, JC. Thank you. Scott says, altar, cylinders, no more bids, altar. I do not know enough to make a decision or even educated guess, altar, says Jason. Okay, I agree. We're going to make one more bid with the altars, you know? Tim says, clay cylinders. We'll see. Let, let me see the credit rating, Tim, because I think... I, I, I don't know the clay cylinders. I think the altar, you know? You've drawn enough attention to yourself from the agents. You know, I, I, I kind of want to bid on the altar. I think that's going to be maybe our final bid. Altar, 103. You decide on a fair bid for the gemstone studded altar and submit your offer. Not long, altar, uh, not, not long uh, after, uh, Mr. Warren empties the ballot box and begins sipping through the entries for the highest bid. Tim says the altar looks good. Yeah, the old. I think the old. I think the cylinders might be. I don't know, man. I don't know. Make an appraise or credit rating. Yes, we need to do. A, oh, credit rating at hard. Damn. Okay, so this thing it might be important. So. Credit rating at hard. Let me just go up. Our credit rating at hard would be twenty four. Okay. So, yeah, Tim gifted me the Dark Side Detective. There, there will be Dark Side Detective shenanigans. 24 people. We got a 28. What do you say? We use four lock points or do we leave it be? People are saying lock. Four lock, four lock. Okay, okay. If we fail a lock check then, you know, later, remember that this is because... Okay, our lock goes to 54 and we succeed. If you succeed, go to 19. Luck points, we went this far, says living life. Yes. Finally, you hear your name called. Your bid for the altar was found to be the highest. You are now saddled with a large and bulky item, easy the size of a traveler's trunk. Not unmanageable, but definitely more than you prefer to lug around. Still, it is surprisingly light considering the number of gemstones. I'm just going to get rid of the dice cam and the sheet. Uh, surprisingly light considering the number of gemstones working to the ancient wood. Naturally, those will make it quite valuable. And the strange painter, uh, painted crows provoke your interest. Reduce your credit rating by 5%. I'll go to 81. Okay, character sheet. Credit rating goes to 43. 
We're just wasting money here, you know? Okay, so. Dice cam. Scott, I think you're a little behind on the stream. I, I took the dice cam away a, a, a while ago. Joe says that this Ray JC is going to be uh, out of luck later. Yes, I might be out of luck later. I know. Okay, so we need the altar. I'm just going to write it here. Altar. Okay. So. Um, go to 81. I don't think we should bid on anything else, you know? Or we could bid on the clay cylinders, but do not push the, you know, don't use lock points. What do you think? Scott says no more bids. Like I said, I propose we bid on the cylinders, but we let the result just stand. Yeah, bro. <laughs> I don't think, bro. Cylinders, no more bids, clay cylinders, bid no lock, bid no lock, bid no lock. Okay, we're gonna do this. If we need those points later, I'll blame it on team and Jason, and then I'll play dumb, says Paul. <laughs> okay, we're gonna bid on the clay cylinders. That's going to be our final, our final bid. We go to 24. Okay, and the link in that is not working, so I have to go do it by hand. 24. You write a reasonable bid for the pair of clay cylinders and place it on the box. Shortly after you do, Mr. Warren clears the box and begins checking the bids. Okay, our credit rating is 43 and I need to do a regular appraiser credit rating roll. Oh no, at hard difficulty. Oh crap, so hard. We need to do 21. Change the cylinder. Yes, we need to do 21. Okay, dice cam coming. 21, people. 21. Look, using all of our luck here. Mm. 27. So close, but... Like I said, we're not going to use any more luck points on this. We failed. Go to 73. It was close, you know? It was really close. Though you wish to buy the curious clay cylinder, someone else plays a higher bid. You hear Mr. Warren announce the name Arthur Duncan. And you see one of the dark suited pair approach uh, to take the item from him. Oh, the man in black. The MIB were looking for the cylinder. Okay, go to 81. Okay, I think we're not going to bid on anything else. And we should leave now, you know? Know the name Arthur Duncan. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm going to write this down, you know? Um, I don't have anything to take notes here. I'm just going to write it down on my piece of paper, you know? So Arthur, Duncan, MIB, Men in Black. Tech 49 says, so is JC trying to finance a new house here or something? I'm, 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 an, I'm a professor that is bidding on the, on the, you know, the sale for a late professor, which he got squished, you know? And uh, there's something weird afoot in this town. Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones says uh, Big Daddy. Yes, my, you mean Noisy Cricket? Yes. Or Series 4 The Atomizer. Okay, we're not going to bid on anything else, you know. Executive decision has been made. We're going to go... Uh, not going to bid on anything else. We go to 16. 
Why do you keep showing me this? That's weird. 16. Your business here is completed. You see the crowd staring covetously at the newly acquired items and you spot Emilia looking smug and satisfied with a leather bag full of cash. Mr. Warren begins to clear away the tables while Officer Powell stands by the door and directs people out of the building and into the even the ever thickening fog. Though some seem content and stay and socialize, uh, you feel that it would be best to go to bed down uh, uh, go bed down for the night. And Tech 49 says Mike needs a new portal gun. Yes, I don't know how that you know like weaves into the story, but okay. Go to 26. Okay. So 26. I don't trust Amelia as far as I could throw her. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Imagine if she's as big as tall vampire lady. You could not throw her. In fact, she would step on you. I don't know. 26. While the estate sale seems interesting, you would feel more secure with a roof over your head for the night. You pull someone out of the crowd and inquire as to where you can find a room to rent. This could have been written better, you know, because we actually stayed for the sale and we got uh, a few items, you know. You're directed a few blocks down, uh, a few blocks into town. Uh, Tim Seaholm says, smash the like button and go to page 666. Yes, most likely we're going to go to hell. So. But yeah, you know, we it is a good thing to to always, uh, 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 you know, appease the almighty YouTube algorithm. So so the, the, the like button is a good thing. Uh, you're directed a few blocks into town uh, to a modestly priced hotel a few buildings down from Esbury Police Station. As you enter in from the cold air night, you're greeted by the heat of a roaring fire. The small front room feels stuffy and cramped. The bulk of the space is dominated by the large service counter, behind which sits a wiry-looking wisp of a woman. She turns her eye, wide eyes to you and asks your name, then quotes you a prize that's more than fair. With the transaction complete, you hold your thin briefcase up the stairs and also all the junk that we bought. You know? uh, unpack it and settle into your room for the night. Go to nine. Yes, Joe, if you had a neuralizer, you would never pay for delivery pizza. You wake in the morning, grateful for the rest. You rise from your bed and take in the modest surroundings that make up your room. The furnishings are sparse. A small, uh, a poor quality dresser and a cramped and dusty writing desk tucked in the corner. Sitting atop the desk is a plate of eggs and toast. Oh, delicious and moist. Apparently set out for you by the hotel owner. The walls are plain and unadorned, save for a single window that faces towards the lake. However, this view is currently blocked by the incredibly thick fog. It's thick, you know? JC, what are the numbers in parents under the go-to page listings? The, the, the pages from where you could have come to this thing. Um, the thick fog, which has taken on a pale blue hue, a pale, pale green hue. Your vision is obscured entirely, and you cannot see into the depths of that outlandish green mist. Hey Ken, how are you? The old lady behind the counter is the same from the mouth of madness. I was thinking something like that. She looks like the, like the, the lady from In the Mouth of Madness, best Lovecraftian movie ever. You also notice your personal belongings placed around the room exactly as you left them from the night before. Go to 106. Okay. 106. After getting dressed and eating the modest breakfast, but it was delicious and moist, uh, you're ready to begin your day. You take a moment to consider what that means for you. Your mind turns to Professor Harris. If you're so inclined, you might be able to investigate the circumstances of his death further. Considering that you don't have... Uh, his widow Emilian's address, uh, you would have to start your search with the official report filed with Officer Powell at the police station. Alternatively, you could take this free time to look through your belongings and examine any items you might have. The hotel owner has been in your room, so a check for your things might be in order. Or perhaps you have some other reason to look over your possessions. 
Finally, if you feel that your business in Asbury is concluded, you could always try to find Lance Sanford at the ferry. Okay, so what do we do? Do we go to the police station in order to try to learn a little bit more about Professor Harris's death and maybe uh, the address of Amelia Harris, you know, the widow? Do we look over the items or do we leave? What do we do? Police station, items or leave? Uh, Bradford says go to the police station. Okay, look over the items, check your bags, look over the new items, police items, items. We're getting more items, yes. Okay, look over items. We're gonna do the items, you know? Items, then police station. I don't know if we can do that, Ken, we're gonna try. Okay, so the items, 32. <laughs> and Joe said leave. <laughs> 32. A cursory inspection of your personal belongings reveals that nothing is amiss. All of your possessions are just as you left them. While you are here looking things over, you can take this opportunity to more closely scrutinize items bought at the estate sale. Oh, that's good. Alternatively, you may leave and go explore elsewhere if your curiosity is satisfied. After examining each item, you will be directed to this entry or given the option to proceed as appropriate. If you have none of the items or you're done looking over what you brought, or you bought, choose to investigate elsewhere. Okay, good. So, we're going to check the items and we're going to keep coming back to this. So, we're going to check the items in order, you know. So, let me check over here which items do we have. We have... Journal, strange idol, and altar. That is what we have. So, first we're gonna check the, the journal. Okay. Yeah, we, we can keep coming back to this and we don't have a limit to check. So, we're gonna check the three items, you know? We're gonna check the item, the journal, and the idol. So, if you bought the journal from the state sale and want to look at it, 74. Okay, 74. Though you glance at the notebook during the estate sale, you haven't had time to properly look it over until now. Reading through the book, you become deeply engrossed and spend the next few hours in study. The time spent yields valuable information. Professor Harry made several trips to India, starting about 12 years ago. During these visits, he went to multiple sites to make observations and recover artifacts. He was Indiana Jones. Uh, his longest and most profitable trips appears to have been 10 years ago during an excursion to Sarnath, India, where he writes about recovering several items from an active Buddhist shrine. Apparently, Professor Harris had some regrets about this theft, but he couldn't resist taking the artifacts for his personal collection. The description of the items he came across in Sarnath matched some of the items at the estate sale last night. The clay cylinders the gemstone encrusted altar and the lizard-like idol are all described in detail in the entries related to the trip to Sarnath. These same items then appeared throughout the rest of his journal. He'd clearly been studying them over the past decade and developed something of a fixation with them. It was the idol that initially caught Harris's eyes. And according to him, the, de the, de the depiction of the great and grotesque uh, water lizard matched no description of any known Hindu deity. Hoping to find clues to the idol, uh, idol's identity, Harris set about trying to translate the mysterious script on the cylinders and the altar. In doing so, he met with significant difficulty, as the text was only barely recognizable as an archaic dialect of pre-Sanskrit Sanskrit, uh, language. The process was slow and painstaking about, uh, until about a year ago. Interesting. At this time, Professor Harris writes of having a strange and enlightened dream. He reports walking in the ancient world from whence these items originated. A grand city of marble walls and onyx streets of bronze gates and marvelous palaces and gardens. He writes of visiting the 17 tower temples of this ancient city and meeting the bearded gods who dwelt there. He, they had beard, they hid something. Sat upon their ivory thrones. 
Harris calls the strange place Sarnath, despite the sheer impossibility of this. He claims that among the temples he learned the secrets of the ancient writing. His next entry goes on to describe the old clay cylinders as the brick cylinders of Cadatheron, though he hadn't yet identified the other objects. The new few pages, uh, the next few pages have been torn from the journal. So maybe, maybe the, 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 the cylinders were important after all. I don't know. The entry resumes with more Monday matters, though there are still references to the artifacts from time to time. The most recent entries in the journal speak of Harris's daily studies and living with Amelia. It's clear that he cared about her deeply from the way he writes about her, but he laments that his studies keep him from spending the time with her that he would like, you know, wink wink. Instead, he lavishes her with gifts and money which he was all too happy to accept. He, noticed, he notes that Amelia has never been happy despite the distance between them. Uh, ha had never been happier despite the distance between them. She liked the money, you know, wink wink. The last entry to catch your eye is dated a little over a week ago. Apparently, the pages torn from his journal went missing only recently. Professor Harris expresses deep concern at this as there were no signs of forced entry to his study and only he and Amelia had access to it, though he was sure he hadn't removed them from the journal himself. You finish your reading by glossing over the last week of the professor's life, which is rather uneventful and peaceful beyond his continued obsession with the artifacts and his occasional worries about Amelia. Okay. Scott says Amelia, money grubbing thief, stealing those pages. Could be, could be someone else. I will reserve judgment for now. We go back to 32. Okay, so we're going to, exp uh, you know, we're going to investigate the idol now. We go to eight. She's guilty, says Yellow Tiger. Okay, eight. My dog is barking. You look over the uh, you look the idol over. It is made of a sea green stone and chiseled in the likeness of a water lizard of some sort. The sculptor uh, sculptor is grotesque and hideous, and the very depiction of the lizard-like creature unnerves you. Still, the work is extremely well preserved and unquestionably ancient. You feel uncomfortable staring at the alien-looking thing for so for long, so you stow it away under the bed and out of sight. Go to 32. Okay, so we got a little bit freaked out by the idol. The last thing we need to investigate is the altar. Go to 128. You examine the extraordinary altar, the most readily apparent feature beyond its size are the many gemstones set into the, its surface. They are of a greenish yellow color and, shrine, and shine even in the half, life of the, uh, half light of the room. You also notice strange lettering written in broad strokes along the object's side. The symbols are smeared and sloppily done, suggesting they were written with some haste. Some sort of incantation? A, a word, a some sort of binding spell, maybe. Hmm. What you had originally taken for paint is, upon closer inspection, dried blood. While you cannot be certain, it would appear that this item has been involved in some tragedy. Go to thirty-two. Okay. Okay, we have inspected, I think this is the altar, you know? Yeah, strange altar. This is a picture of the strange altar. It looks like the art of the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, you know, from Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. If we open this, we're gonna go like, and we're gonna just like die. Spell is possible with blood being used, says Scott, yeah. Jason says, no Indiana Jones, they don't belong in the museum, they belong to the monk. Give them back and get the hell out of there. Mark my words. Hmm. Okay, so we investigated what we could investigate. We have now two options. Police station, in order to gather more information about how Harris died or leave the town. So what do we do? Do we go to the police station or we leave town in the ferry? 
attempt to leave town in the ferry. You never know when you try to leave these places. Come on, what do we do? Police station, leave. Those are our options. Police station, police station. Jason said leave, police station. Leave, police. One, two, three, four, five versus two. Okay, we're gonna go to the police station. 11. <laughs> Joe says, run, don't walk the hell out of there. It could be a good idea, you know? But you know, we're, we're investigating, you know? You step out into the greenish mist. You know, the fact that the town is now engulfed in a greenish mist. Weird. You feel it clinging tightly to you as you make your way the short distance to the police station. Upon entering the small brick building, you are struck with a sense of claustrophobia. The walls here are uncomfortably close together, and space is tight. Jason says, why am I the voice of reason in this one? <laughs> I don't know, man, I don't know. Um, Cram into the tiny structure are a large desk, several filing cabinets, and a few chairs. A closed side holding cell with iron bar sits at the rear of the room. Behind the large desk is Officer Powell, smoking a cigar with his feet propped up on the table. His coat is unbuttoned and his hat lies on top of a stack of papers, next to a battered old revolver. He opens one eye, one eye and, fro and frowns at you, siding through his cigar as he straightens himself up to look presentable. <clears throat> If you're bothering me right now, I'm going to assume this is important. You mentioned that you would like to see the police report for Professor William's death, Har uh, William Harry's death, to which he replies with a snort. <laughs> you have no business dealing with that, and even if you did, this is my jurisdiction. Shove off. Leave me in peace. He doesn't seem cooperative, but perhaps you could convince him that you have some special circumstances that warrant your looking through the files. Jason says, hey, might as well squirrel it. Yes. Make a fast tag roll. If you succeed, go to 45. You fail fast talk. I don't think we put some points into fast talk. Our fast talk is five. Okay. 5% 5 chance. Here we go, people. Just blowing some luck into it. I'm just checking something. Is this a... It's a 90. We got a 98. So we failed, you know? In fact, if this had been like a, a different kind of roll, I think a 98 and more is like an extreme fail and you get like un, unpleasant uh, circumstances. Yes, it's an extreme failure, you know? I think it's 98 and more. But we don't have any consequences for this, so we, we fail, we go to 101. Okay. You try to convince the officer that you have a particularly good reason for needed access to the file, but he simply doesn't care, you know? He does not... Oh, uh, sorry, I'm going to get rid of the sheet and the dice cam. He does not give up about the thing, you know? Good thing you were not defusing the bomb. Yes, extreme squirrel. Yes. Yeah, 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 I, I saw the, the dice cam, you know? Uh, you try to convince the officer that you have a particularly good reason for needing access to the file, but he simply does not care. Scrum, stranger, you're ruining my smoke. If you want to dig at the dead guy, go bother his widow. Her place is over there on the north side of the town, right next to the church. Can't damn well miss it. Officer Powell will be of no more help at this time. Okay, we got two options. We can go to Harry's house or we can go back to the hotel. 
I'm guessing if we go back to the hotel, it's going to probably be to gather our belongings or leave. So, what do you think? Harry's house or hotel? Yeah, we got some info, you know. Got the address, go to the house, 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 house. Harris's house. Yes. Okay. We're gonna go to the Harris's house. Go to 90. <clears throat> so you walk into town towards the Harris's address. Even knowing the location is difficult for you to find your way due you to your unfamiliarity with the town and the density of the peculiar green mist. As a result, it's some time before you arrive at the Harris house. Hey Greg, how are you? We're investigating in a town, you know, there's a professor who died. We came to this town looking to get some information about his death and we at, a, at an auction we got some of his belongings. And now we are heading over to talk to his widow, you know. Professor William Harris is the, the, the name of the, of the late professor. So, as you approach the building, a man steps out of the fog, blocking your path. He is young and thin, with rather angular features and the faint hint of a mustache atop his lip. Like so. This is one of the MIBs. He's dressed in a dark suit and stares at you from beneath a flat cap. You are an unwelcome surprise. I don't know what you're looking for, but you won't find it here. Then he puts up a neuralizer and goes like, Pew! no, no. Um, uh, your eyes betray you as you glance at the Harris house. The man scowls visibly. Why don't you leave the poor widow alone, you creep? If you want to bother her, you're going to have to go through old Joshua here. Capish? Greg Holder says, I have not played this version of Call of Cthulhu RPG. It is a solo adventure, you know? You can play it by yourself. You, you use this thing. It's like a choose your own adventure thing. So now apparently we're going to have to fight or do something. Let me see. Um, his hand brushes beneath his coat as if searching for something, but then he stops himself. He pauses for a moment, looking you over once more before spitting on the ground at your feet and turning away. We could call out Joshua, we can make our way to the Harris house, and we can heed his warning and return to the old hotel. So where do we go? Do we call him out? Do we go to Harris's house? Or do we return to the hotel? I would proceed to the house, you know? Continue to the house, continue to the house. We got two, continue to the house, go to the house. Yeah, we're not going to go looking for trouble, you know? We're going to go to the house, rerun said the hotel, the rest saying house. Okay, we're going to continue to the house, you know? Okay, 55. Jason says, keeping him the nuts. No, we're trying to de-escalate the situation, you know? We're gonna go to the f house. Excuse me. There we go. <laughs> Jason said, I meant the house. Okay. So, 55. Despite Joshua's urgings, you feel compelled to speak to Amelia yourself. And Jason says, kick the pawn in the family jewels and steal his wallet. <laughs> Greg says, I need more sleep to keep up with this awesomeness. Okay, Greg, don't worry. It's going to be happiness in charity as soon as YouTube is done processing. It's a good story, you know. You approach the front of the house and note your surroundings. The house's exterior hints at the wealth of the occupants, but then again, so do most places in town. It's a wealthy town, you know. Directly across from the residence is a small church whose religious iconography seems to have inspired the Harrises in the design of their own home. A bronze cross hangs over the front door, and decorative columns line the outside walls of the two-story house. All in all, the architectural style is somewhat baroque, complete with a pair of carved, angel, uh, carved angels lounging beneath the eaves that are just visible through the strange haze. The, the, the green mist. You knock on the door, 
and wait in the mist for a few moments, hoping for someone to hear you. Eventually, much to your relief, the widow Amelia answers the door. She's wearing a bright red dress, which accents her deep crimson lipstick. Greg says you have 27 likes and 20 watching presently. That is awesome. That is awesome. You know? I know Call of Cthulhu is not something that appeals to you know, like the masses to draw massive streams, you know. But I like it. I like it. I like the RPG. And I, I appreciate the people like watching in chat and playing with us. So thank you. Thank you for everything. Greg says myself included, of course. Thank you, Greg. So she appeared with the bright red dress, the lipstick, you know. She appears to have taken great care over her appearance. She flashes you a smile and invites you inside. The house opens into a large foyer and you see various crates and bundles stack high along the walls. Just selling off a few of, uh, of the more common things. Mind the mess, the porter hasn't come for it yet. She takes you by the hand to lead you past the stacks of items helping you to pick your way through the deceased Professor Harry's assembled possessions. She takes you into a small drawing room full of antique furniture and offers you some coffee. After settling in and exchanging a few well-mannered pleasantries, you ask in more detail about the late Professor Harris. Amelia sighs theatrically, she goes like this, and looks down at her hands. I can't imagine what you want to ask about William. I found him in his study, with the gun still in his mouth. What more could you want to know? Oh, we're going to make a psychology check. Okay. Psychology. We have a 50. Oh, nice. So, 50-50. Let's roll the dice. Let's go to the dice cam. Surprise you, dogs didn't start barking when you're not. Yeah, well, they were well over there, you know? Like, way over there. 50. We're looking for a 50 or less. Forty-seven. We succeeded. Okay, so. Get this and this. Okay, we succeeded, so we go to 126. 126. Nice, yes. Uh, you can see this is a picture of the lake, you know? Pretty creepy, if you ask me. So, 126. You don't know why you hadn't realized it before. Selling all of his things, adopting such a flirty demeanor, Dismissing questions about her husband's death, Amelia doesn't seem too broken up about her husband's passing. She's hiding something. She might even have a beard, you know, because she's hiding something. You'd bet your career on it. You suspect she's involved in Professor Harris's death in some form or another. You open your mouth, you go like this, preparing to call her bluff and press her for more information but you are interrupted by a loud knock at the door. Amelia jumps up, startled, stands there for a moment in confusion as the pounding on the door resumes. Police, open the door! Amelia's face drains white as she goes to answer the knock. Your gut tells you something is wrong here. You feel uneasy about the officer at the door. You tell yourself you're being irrational and on edge but you have some trouble fighting that feeling. You have a few precious moments to react. To ignore your instincts and wait, go to 47. To take this chance to hide, make a stealth roll. If you succeed, go to... Okay, what do we do? Do we just sit there or we hide? Jason said, Max, just bark at that. Yeah. What do we do? We just sit there or do we hide? Eve Velasquez says hide. Rerun says hide. Yellow Tiger says hide, hide. Okay, we're gonna hide. We need to perform a stealth roll, you know? Jason said just sit there. <laughs> You're being the, the happy little squirrel, you know, Jason? Now, we need to hide. So, what is our stealth? 30. 
Not a lot. Let's go to the dice cam. 30% chance, people. 30%. It's a 92. We failed spectacularly. So, put that and that. So, we failed. We go to 20. Your instincts get the better of you and you feel compelled to make your escape. You rise from your seat, looking for suitable exits. The only way that doesn't lead towards the entrance is through the kitchen. You don't know if there's any exit that way, but you think it's worth a shot. Unfortunately, you never get to take it. As you rise and head for the kitchen doorway, Officer Powell bursts into the room, shouting, Freeze! Police! You glance over your shoulder and see his revolver leveled at you, and you go stiff. You're under arrest for trespassing. You're going to come with me, now. What? He has you dead in his sights. Talking would do you little good as he's already caught you trying to flee the scene. You should probably do what he says. On the other hand, you could try to run. Staring down the barrel of a gun, the odds don't look good, but maybe you're like your chance is better with the gun than the prison cell. What do we do, people? Greg Holden says, Whoa, look like a 62 to me. Is 62 better? No, you. these are percent, uh, percentile. It's a percentile system. You need to roll the number or less, you know? Because you have, if you have a 30 on that skill, you have a 30% chance of succeeding. So you see? So you have to roll a 30 or less. <sighs> Go quietly, run for it, go quietly, run for it, go with the fuzz. I don't recommend running. I think we're going to do a, some sort of check, and then they're going to shoot us, and we're going to die. But let's see what the chat says. Go, 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 run, run, run. Scream Godzilla while pointing behind the officer, and when he locks away, run. We got five runs and we got three go quietly. Wait, why flee? Fleeing from a god in those times was equal to suicide. I agree, Greg, but people need to vote. We are about to make a run for it. We got five runs and, and three goes. I'm guessing go, uh, go and Greg is go, so we're five with five. Next one decides. No turning back, people. Jason says, squirrels again, sight. Yes, the next one decides. Brandon says, go. Okay. We're gonna go. We're gonna go quietly. I'm pretty sure if we made a run for it, you know, they're gonna shoot us in the back and we're gonna go. Okay. So, we're gonna go quietly. 65. The officer is armed and angry. So you decide it's probably best not to resist. You're escorted out of the house at gunpoint and into the sickly green fog. And Jason says, phew, yeah. Amelia neither says nor does anything as you pass. She simply stares at you as you go. I don't like her. On the street, just outside the Harris property, you spot Joshua, grinning madly. That jackass! You know, he, he's the one who set us up. Your eye, uh, his eyes meet yours and his smiles get just a bit wider. He puts officer power up to this. He's not even trying to hide it. That still doesn't explain why, but at least you know for, uh, for a certainty that Joshua is not friendly to you and that he has power in his pocket. You mull this over as you march through the misty streets and taken to the police station. You are ushered into the dim and dingy room and shoved into a closet side cell on the far wall. Officer Power turns the key in the lock, sealing you in the cell. Uh, he settles into his seat and pays you no further mind as he begins puffing on a cigar. Time to silence a rat. Yeah, he sure did. Yes. He seems to have no intention of letting you go anytime soon. 
So, to wait for the knight in the cell, go to 84 to attempt an escape, make a locksmith roll if you succeed, okay? To try to convince him to let you know, make a fast talk roll. Okay, before, before voting on this, Jonathan says, hello JC, sorry, got a little late to the stream. Don't worry, Jonathan, don't worry. We're making a decision now. We need to decide if we wait, if we try a locksmith, we have a 50% chance in locksmith, which is not bad. Fast talk, we have 5%, so that's out of the question. So we wait or we use the locksmith. I would recommend waiting, you know, because if the locksmith is 50-50. So what do you say? Scott says, my problem is I end up reading the alternate options if I was playing this myself. Well, you have to have the discipline, you know, you follow the story and you commit. Wait, 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 wait. Yes, we're going to wait. Making an escape, not good. We're going to wait. 84. Officer Powell glowers at your every little action, despite his laziness. Uh, he keeps a close eyes on you and you won't be slipping away anytime soon. Scott said, pick the lock. <laughs> no matter what words you try, he ignores your pleas for release. The hours drag on. As the two of you sit alone in the room, the air becomes warm and stifling. Powers uh, opens the windows to let the room air out. You stare out into the green fog and feel a great sense of unease, as if something is staring back at you. You shake off this irrational fear and busy your mind with thoughts of how to obtain freedom. You don't ponder for long. Your sense of unease grows greater until it's all-consuming. Waiting can bring an interesting surprise that can be good as well as bad. Yes, I agree. Um, your sense of unease grows greater until it's all-consuming. You know that something is coming. You hear the shouting first. People panicking in the streets. It's going down, people. It's going down. People panicking in the streets. Officer Powell jerks out of his silent vigil when the shouting begins, before rushing outside to restore order. Jason says, take a nap. It's, it's starting to go down, bro. It's starting to go down. He's gone for quite some time, and the shouting continues. And then the water rises, seeping through the doorway and into the small building that you're stuck in. At first, it merely wets the floor, but soon you're up to your ankles in it, then your knees, then your waist. In the course of a few hours, it rises with little sign of stopping. Between the bars, the fog, and the water, you feel thoroughly trapped. Scott says, I, did, I think we're going to die in the cell. Yeah. Greg Holden says, my line of thought is start making a move. Well, we're in the trap in the cell, you know. Quick, get a, st a, a straw and start drinking. Yes. <laughs> and Jason says, it's going to end like the dude in the cell and the beast within. Well. Um, between the bars, the fog and the water, you feel thoroughly trapped. Oh, greeting the great one, yeah. Real madness overtakes you now. You swear that you can make out strange and alien shapes within the swirling mist. Horrible, flabby thing with slender limbs and sagging features. They're going like this, you see? They are decidedly unhuman. When these hallucinations, for uh, that is what they must surely be, begin, you hear the shouts turn to full-fledged screams and then die out in the night, choked by the, mid, by the mist. Loximus time? I, I hope so. I need to uh, see, you know, like, wonder if they give me the chance, you know? Uh, through the window... You see the light from multiple fires glowing within Esbury, illuminating and consuming everything, even as the water rises to swallow up the town. So the town is on fire and sinking. You smell the smoke mingling with the fog. You try to convince yourself that you're having a panic attack, that this is all a dream, 
that it isn't, re it isn't real. You don't know what is happening or why. You have no idea how these cruel and unnaturally horrific things came to be. You have no idea why they emerged from that eerie frog. fog. You don't know any of the reasons for this. And you never will. The water rises and you float upwards, gasping for air with only inches between you and the ceiling. As the water rises over your head, your lungs fill and you drown. You have died! As it stands, your character died ignorant of the nature of these unholy horrors. And perhaps that is for the best. If you wish, you may begin again and try for a better outcome, or at least one that explains the goings on further. For now, though, your visit to, the, to Esbury is over. D. End. And Greg Holden says, is that it, huh? That was sudden. Yes. Okay. I'm going to exercise keeper discretion, you know. And we're going to turn back time one time to 65. And we're going to try the locksmith. Just so don't we, we don't have to do a full stream again to do this. So, going back... Keep our discretion. Greg Holden says, what stuff do we have here? These are our stats, you know? I'm just gonna show them. They're good stats, you know? And these are investigator skills. But like I said, in honor of, of how long we've been playing this, we've been playing for 2 hours and 27 minutes. We know fast tag is a no-go because we would have to succeed on a 5% roll. So we're going to attempt to make a locksmith roll, you know? Locksmith roll, like I said, going back, our skill indicates locksmith is 50. So we need to beat a 50. If we die here, we die, you know? But... We're taking a, a mulligan or something like that. Extreme success. Five. Okay, people. We succeeded. Yes, we made it. We go to 107. 107. You spot a paper clip lying just outside the bars of your cell. No doubt it fell over one of the stacks of documents on Officer Powell's desk. You slip your hand between the bars and reach out to grab it, sighting with relief at your good fortune. You bend the paper clip to serve as an improvised lockpick. Lock <laughs> and Paul says, if anyone can look at it right over here, puts on sunglasses, neuralizer time. Boop, yes, you forgot everything that happened and you died? And now you are back in the cell and we get we succeeded and we can and we're opening the thing. Yes, the story lives a little bit longer. And <laughs> Rerun says, what was that earlier? Yeah, I don't know what happened. Okay, so glancing up, you see that Officer Powell is still turned away from you, puffing absentmindedly on his cigar. You set to work trying to get the lock open. The lock is strong as it is meant to keep criminals safely behind bars, but it is no match for your skills. It takes you some time to finally get it open, but eventually you feel it give away. Give way. You check on Officer Powell one more time. He seems to be paying you no, no attention. If your luck holds, you may be able to sneak out of the prison cell without him noticing. Yes, like loading a safe, exactly. We need to make a stealth roll. Okay, what is our stealth number? Stealth, 30. Oh crap, 30. Let's go to the dice, 30. Okay, people, big money, big money. We need a 30, 30 or less. Eighteen, 18, we succeeded on the stealth roll. Nice. 
No, see the premier. That would have been a that would have been a fail, you know. Eighteen. So we go to ten. Nice. Yes, success. You slip silently out of your cell and press low to the ground, you know. Powell is reading over his documents and puffing away contently at his cigar. He doesn't notice your breakout. After several tense minutes, you manage to inch your way towards the building, uh, building's entrance. You crack the door open just enough to escape, closing it behind you as you exit. We're outside the, the, the jail, you know? It was a... We, we dying in the jail was a bad dream, you know? It was a bad dream. And the elder gods, they intervened, and now we're here. That's the official... This is the official storyline now. Um... You know, stand amid, uh, amid the, the dim, dank fog. It's dank, you know. You know, the last of the sun uh, rays illuminated the mist above you, but your vision is largely obscured by both the haze and the growing darkness. Given your recent escape, it would not be wise to linger here. You weigh your options. You could address the problem head on by returning to the Harris house to look for clues. You might also consider returning to the hotel to gather your thoughts, or you could simply put this all behind you and skip down. It's too late and too foggy for the ferry to be operational, but you know there are smaller side roads that wind around the lake. You have to make the journey on foot and in the dark, but an unpleasant option is still an option. Okay, no more fudging roles or, you know, like choices. Now you choose. What do we do? Do we do we go to Harry's house? Do we go to the hotel? Or do we make a run for it? And leave town? What do we do? Rerun says clues. Yeah, fudging. Leave. Clues. Hotel. Harry. Clues. Get out. We get we got. Interestingly enough, we got two leaves. One, two, three, four, five clues and two hotels. And one more clue. Okay, we're gonna go, we're gonna go get some clues. I like it, you know, I, I, I commend you on your investigated, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the thing, you know, it, it, it eats at you, you need to investigate. We go to the Harris's house, 147, to learn what the hell is going on. Ooh, the elder sign. 147. You make your way through the foggy streets of Esbury. Sometimes the chicken runs leads to clues. So we're running into the fire. Yes, Jason. Happy squirrels. No, I like it. You know, we're, we're investigators. We're going deep, even if we die. You don't solve Call of Cthulhu without taking some chances, like like uh, like uh, Scott said. Yes. <laughs> and Joe said, uh, realizing you're a law-abiding citizen, then sneak back into jail. <laughs> okay, you make your way through the foggy streets of Esbury, heading once more to the Harris house. As your feet hit the road's flagstones, you hear the sound of your footsteps reflected back by the walls of the buildings all around you. Otherwise, it remains quiet and sleepy. The light is very dim and growing darker by the second. By the time you find yourself once more at Amelia Harris's house, night has fallen. As you approach the building, you freeze dead in your tracks as a woman in a red dress passes mere feet from you. Amelia Harris. She doesn't seem to notice you, in part because of the fog, but also because she looks lost in thought. You watch her move hurriedly through the mist and enter the nearby church. You could choose to enter the Harris house and search the premises, or you could pursue Amelia for questioning. What do we do, house or Amelia? Jason said, walk in the grass. <laughs> yeah, with the footsteps, you know? Scott said, Amelia. Jonathan said, house. Amelia, that ass. I'm guessing Amelia, Amelia, Amelia. Okay, we're gonna follow Amelia. Go to 164. Just so you know how many choices we made. You see? 
a lot of stall. 164. You hurry through the shrouded streets and take refuge in the church. The door creaks abominably as you enter, so there's no chance of slipping in unnoticed. You find yourself in a large chapel with hand-carved pews flanking you on either side. These continue for several rows until they reach a pulpit from which the priest will normally conduct, conduct services. With the last of the fog filtered daylight fading through the stained glass windows, you are aware that they, these are not the hours of a typical service. Time flies when you're having fun, yes. The church is open to the public during off times, but the sole occupants are yourself and Emilia, who's taking a seat in the front row and is praying with her head bowed. Greg Holden says, this could end up being a, a gamble. Yes. And CDP Mia says, pew, 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 because of the pews. Hashtag pawn. She does not lift her gaze as you take a seat next to her. You sit there for a minute and allow her time to finish her prayers. You need information from her, but you're respectful of her devotions. Finally, she opens her, her eyes and looks at you, sighing softly as she does so. She looks somewhat nervous and the color drains from her face. What is that you want? You're not supposed to be here. Now we'll die a sacrifice instead of drowning. Yeah, maybe. To press for more information about Professor Harris's dad, go to 54. To ask about Joshua, go to 130. What do we do? Harris or Joshua? Scott says Joshua. We got one vote for Joshua. He's the jackass that framed us, you know. Joshua, most girls ask. Josh. Harris. Joshua. Joshua. Okay. You people want revenge. Okay. Let's talk about Joshua. MIB. 130. You ask Amelia about Joshua, his relationship to her, and why he would have you arrested. Josh and I have been intimate for a few years. Oh, okay. This is getting interesting. My husband was a good man when he wasn't obsessing over his work, but he was sometimes away for so long and paid so much attention to his books. I have needs. A woman my age shouldn't be neglected. I met Josh through his whiskey business. He bootlegs for the whole town. Scott says, actually trying to figure out if Joshua is a real threat. Uh, well, he did it all for the Nuki, you know, like the Limp Bizkit uh, song. Um, one thing led to another and she smiles, lost in thought. We were happy, even with William around. Cougar, says <laughs> Jason. Recently, though, Josh had been insisting that we get him out of the picture so that we could be together. I didn't like it, but I agreed. I let Josh take care of it. Oh, damn. Yeah, she, she cheated and she, she cheated and Joshua killed the professor. She's not a nice lady. I let Josh take care of it. I just wanted it to be left behind us and for us to be together. I told him I wanted to sell everything and leave town. Just the two of us. I think that was the first time I saw him angry. He never said why weird. She looks down at her hands, trying to avoid your gaze. You don't have to worry about anything. We we'll leave town just as, uh, as soon as we can. I suggest you do the same. Murder solved, yes. She rises to leave, then hesitates a moment. I don't know if this helps, but I think he might have been angry because I wanted to sell my husband's effects. The day after, oh, he was trying to get close to her to get to the, to the stuff, you know. He is MIB. <clears throat> the day after William died, I found Josh in the study. He never went in there until after William was dead. I've caught him in there multiple times these past few days. I can't imagine what he could, would, could would want with William's thing, though. She pauses and then continues. It scares me, you know, the way he's been acting. If you need to find him, his house is across the street over there right outside and to the left. He won't be alone. He brought some friends in from out of town. I wouldn't recommend going over there. He doesn't like you. 
She looks away from you, then walks out of the room uh, at a brisk spray, uh, pace, leaving you alone in the chapel. Hmm. So we can go to the H Harry's house to continue the investigation. We can go to Joshua, but th there's people there. We can go to the hotel, or we can leave. What do we do? What would you like to do, people? Personally, I think it would be go to maybe... I want to know, you know? I want to know. I would like to go to the Harry's house. Joshua. Lepelupi, that would kill us, most likely. Harry's, hotel, leave, go to the jackass place. Whoa, that would kill us. So we get... Harry's, Harry's. Okay, people are, you know, like getting into their senses. Go to the Harry's house. I agree. We're going to go to the Harry's house. We go to seven. Seven. Leave, see, you actually can or not. Well, with no immediate threat to yourself, you are free to explore the Harris's home, though you do so quickly in case someone comes looking. Glancing about the sitting room you are in, you find it's a bit of a mess from the early scuffle. Glancing towards the entrance, you know the, you know, know the foyer, foyer filled with boxes, crates, and other unidentifiable objects covered with dust sheets. Um, you poke your head into the next room and find a kitchen and an adjacent dining room both spotlessly maintained, though sparsely furnished. Uh, picking uh, beneath the dusty sheets in the, uh, sheets in the entryway, you find various items of furniture and decor, as well as stacks and stacks of books. Many of them are historical texts and reference materials, some of which were written by Professor Harris himself. There is also a large number of general works of science and literature, as benefits uh, any well-educated man. As befits, any well-educated man. You place the cover back down, sensing that you will find nothing of value here. You turn your attention instead to the set of stairs opposite the entrance. You ascend the staircase and see two doors, one to either side of you. The door to your left is slightly ajar and no doubt leads to the bedroom. By a process of elimination, the door to your right must lead to the study. It seems to be locked and your earlier search of the house did not yield a key. With enough time, you might be able to get the door open, but it would probably be unwise to spend too long trying since Amelia, or one of those close to her, may return soon. To enter the bedroom, go to 123. To enter the study, make a locksmith roll. If you succeed, go to 108. If you fail, go to 75. If you fail this roll, you may attempt to push it and roll again, but if you fail a second time, there will be greater consequences. If you push the roll and succeed, go to 108. If you fail, go to 87. What do we do? Bedroom or pick the lock? Pick the lock, says Scott. Study, the lock, the locksmith. Locksmith roll, pick lock. Okay, we're going to do that. So, locksmith was 50. Okay, dice cam. Come on, big money. 40. 40, we succeeded. Greg says, somehow I, I feel like this town is under some weird hex, and since no attempt was made to leave uh, yet by anyone in town, leaves me with suspicion. I don't know. But we succeeded. You see? We succeeded. So, we go to 108. 108. You reach into your pocket and produce the bobby pin that you carry on, uh, on you for such an occasion. Weirdly, we did not have this one when we exited the jail. It just materialized there. Let's say we were still carrying like the, the paper clip. You insert it into the lock and fumble with it for a few minutes. It steers and strains and for several terrible seconds you fear it will break in the lock. And then the tumblers give and the doors click open. 
magic. Yes. You push your way into the small study and find the room much as you expected. The door opens across from a window, which lets in a pale greenish light of the mist. This illuminates the room, which is adorned primarily with mostly empty bookcases. There are also several glass display cases uh, throughout the room, but are similarly empty. It should have been a locksmith instead, says Jason. Yes. At the far end of the room, just beneath the window, is a desk, still littered with the professor's blood-soaked papers. Searching through the desk drawers, you find stacks of notes and various personal items. Buried in the bottom drawer, you find an impossibly old scrap of papyrus pressed into a glass frame. All across the ancient documents are strange and unusual scrolls. As you pick it up to inspect it, you notice a sheet of paper slightly attached to the back, lightly attached to the back of the frame, bearing the same scrolls as the papyrus, but with annotations in its margins. Presumably, this is tr as a translation of the papyrus' text. As you read it over, you marvel at the impossibility of its contents. The papyrus purports to be written by a priest from an unknown city by the name of Illernek. In this account, the priest records observation of an odd and ugly race of beings who once lived upon a lake in the forgotten land of Mnar. The document goes into great detail about the fire rituals of these strange creatures and speak of the haunting dances they would perform in the light of the flames beneath the gibbous moon and always under the watchful eye of a sea green stone idol chiseled in the likeness of a great lizard. We just, you see, you see, is the idol. The creatures are invading the town to, you know, get back the idol. The priest's writings go on to mention rituals used to ward off the influence of that detestable creature, rituals performed by humans. The text for the ritual in the annotation is untranslated and simply renders in standard characters so that it reads, Igayar Nognluli or Bogro. The strange face phrase sticks in your mind. So this is most likely how the professor kept the idol and the creatures did not attack town. You know, she, he used the ritual in order as, as a ward. And that way he could uh he could like you know like keep the idol. Jason says, death by burning at the stake. I can see it now. It, it may happen, you know, it may happen. You pause for a moment to consider the implications. You carefully detach the translation, fold it up and put it in your pocket as evidence before exiting the study. You have learned a ritual chant. Noted in your investigator sheet as ritual chant entry 233. Ritual chant entry 233. When prompted, you may choose to use this chant. If you do so, go to 233. Okay, ritual chant. Um, ritual chant. I'm going to go with arcane tomes and stuff. Ritual chant. Entry 235. Sorry. Entry 235. Okay, it's it's written. You know, I, I wrote it on that thing. Ritual chant, entry 235. So when prompted, we might do so. And now we need to go to 140. We know a ritual, you know, that's good. You turn around and leave the door closed behind you. Looking down the stairs, you realize you are not alone. Dominating the entryway is Joshua, the man in black. Red face and furious. He has a gun in his right hand, which he quickly aims in your direction. You have just a second to hit the ground before he pulls the trigger. Perhaps your reflexes are quite uh, quick enough. We need to make a dodge roll. Okay. 
We need to make a dot roll. If you succeed, go to 132. If you fail, take 1d10 plus 2 damage. Okay. So, dot roll. Our dodge is 50. Not bad. Not bad. You see, dodge is 50. Because we put a lot of points on that. We're going to need it. Yes. So, dice cam, 50. We're looking for a 50. Eighty-six. We fail. So um, we failed. We take one d10 plus two damage. Eight. Eight plus two. Guns. Lots of guns. Yes. So we take ten points of damage. Let's see if we survive that. We need to go to the sheet. So, hit points, 11, we are at one hit point, one, but we are still alive, we are not the one, yes, we are at one hit point people, but we are still alive, we rolled really bad on those things, you yeah? if you survive this, go to 96, we survived. We go to 96. Alive, but cough and bluff. Yes. Joshua aims the gun at you, and you freeze in shock. The weapon goes off in his hand, and the bullet whizzes through the air, tearing open your left shoulder and throwing you back against the wall. You collapse in a heap, blood oozing from your wound. You know it isn't fatal, but that doesn't make the pain any less. As you struggle to fight through the pain, you find Joshua standing over you. The look on his face is one of pure rage. This is the last thing you see as you're clubbed into unconsciousness. Go to 138. That's how they get you. Yes. Oh, look at this. 138. You are awake, stripped of any weapons and tied to a chair in a dusty basement. The first thing you notice is the pain from your wounds. They are still fresh and have not been tended to you in any way. Uh, the second thing you notice is the table across from you with a strange collection of items. A pair of cracked clay cylinders, a gemstone studded altar with curious crawls, a stack of papers and an unnatural looking idol of sea green stone fashioned in the shape of a lizard like uh, creature. These guys stole everything, you know, they have everything. They have our stuff and there's their stuff. CDP Mia says this is a family show, yes. Uh, standing next to the table is a man that you can't quite make out in the dimness of the room. He puffs absent, absently at a cigar as he stares at you. Uh, it might be the, 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 the cop, you know. Behind the table is a steel and, and other bootlegging equipment. You turn your head to see one of the suited men from before leaning against the door, sipping from a flask, man in black. When you begin to move, the unknown man walks over to you. He grins widely, and you spot a glint of madness in his eye as he ho hovers at the end of the illuminated area. He produces a knife from his pocket, and the blade catches the glimmer of the dim bulb flickering above. The stranger shoots a glance at the suited man by the door, who nods, then leaves. The remaining man's come, uh, man comes in the light and presses the knife against your cheek. He goes like this. See? Oh, it's not the cop. It's just a guy. Digs into your flesh, nicking you and drawing a drop of blood on the tip. And you take one hit point in damage and die. No. We still have one hit point. Though you could cause... Tr uh, thought you could cause trouble for Josh, huh? I'm going to enjoy this, getting rid of my little problem. Everything was fine until you started snooping around. You put me and Amelia both in danger here, and you're getting in the way of my plans. So I'm going to enjoy tearing open your throat and offering up your life to the idol. Perhaps it will please him, and then I'll get what, it, what, uh, what I want. I'll finally make my way to that beautiful place that I've seen in my dreams. 
It will be over soon, but I will bleed you slow because I want to enjoy this. Oh, so the idol is just putting visions, you know, controlling people. He takes the knife and presses it in deeper. You struggle reflexively against your bones trying to escape the pain. Perhaps if you struggle hard enough, you can break free. We need to make a strength check. The strength check is going to be 70. Okay. We should be able to do this. 70. Here we go, people. Dice can. Fifty-seven, we succeeded. Nice. Okay, we succeed. One fifteen. Uh oh, crap! You're right. Strength is fifty. What, what 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 was I looking at? Crap. Well, we go back then. One thirty-eight. Strength if fifty. You are absolutely uh, right. No, but but this is Dex. It's not strength. No, the what? No. 138, sorry, 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 sorry. It was a strength roll and we got 54, 57. Lock points, still have lock points. Okay, we're going to use lock. We're going to use seven lock points. So that puts us at 47. And we succeed. Good point, we're going to use this. We did it. We are at 115. This is the fight, you see? People are fighting. This is the image when you have the like the, the, the female professor. Okay, so we used the lock points. Hey Rembrandt Shadows, how are you? Yes, don't worry, it's going to be up in its entirety as soon as YouTube is done processing. So, you struggle against your bonds as you begin to panic. Mercifully, they give way. Joshua is shocked by the sound of snapping rope echoing off the walls, and he jumps away from you on pure reflex. Yes, uh, good enough, the, the lock. You act on instinct. Without thinking, you rush towards him, attempting to wrestle the knife from his grasp. You know that you need to be the one in control of the weapon if you're going to survive this, especially if there's another armed man just outside the door. You grasp Joshua's forearm, preventing him from attacking you with the knife. You then try to pry it from his hand, even as you jab and strike at him with knees and elbows, hoping desperately that you can snatch the blade from his grip. Make a fighting brawl roll. If you succeed, go to 133. Fighting. Fighting brawl, we get a 65. So we should be in good. You see, the sheet says fighting brawl is 65. So dice can. 65. Eighty-two. Eighty-two. We failed. One eighty. Try as you might, you are unable to pry the blade from Joshua's grasp. He manages to land a single, solid punch to your face that sends you reeling backward. In a moment, he's on top of you. Uh, dice came my way, sorry. Joshua locks eyes with you, smiling with wicked glee as he rests the cold metal lightly against your throat. Then his eyes glaze over as he begins speaking in a strange tongue. Grach, nyach, ngono, back through, still da, pludek, a thread run. She speaks each syllable in a slow and monotonous tone, as if his hope uh, is focusing very carefully on the sound of the worlds. We have horrible luck, yes. Well, this happens, you know. 
Call of Cthulhu is like this. As the last syllable passes his lips, Joshua takes the knife and presses it sharply against your neck. With a single smooth motion, he slits your throat. As you bleed out, your eyes perceive impossible visions. The world before you melts away, replaced by a shining city of marble, onyx, and lustrous gems. You see this magnificent city in all its splendor, sitting next to a placid lake. And then, in an instant, is gone, as the water rises up to swallow it. The lizard thing of the idol, given life and power by your blood, surges up from the water. The being eyes you with malicious sentience as the water swells and consumes you. You have been offered as a sacrifice to one of the great old ones. Your visit to Asbury is over. The end. We should have performed the ritual instead of fighting. No, we, we couldn't, uh, Scott. It said when prompted. You know, like the text should have given you the option to perform the ritual, but it did not give us the option. It said when prompted, go to 235. Uh, but we died, you know, we died. But it, this was not a bad run, you know. We we learned a lot of the of the mysteries of this of this death, death by sacrifice. I knew it, said Mac. Yeah, we learned that there was some sort of city, you know, very nice city, and this city was swallowed by the waters. The poopman died. Yes, the poopman dies, and. The thing that came from the water was a great old one, indeed. And the professor had this statue, and possibly by using some sort of charms, kept the influence of this from going. But as the professor died, you know, people started getting the influence of the statue and trying to get the power, you know. Rerun says luck points, like 60, like 50 minutes after we did the thing, you know. Sorry, Rerun, you were kind of a little late. But it's okay, you know, and this, these are the things that rise from the waters, horrible things. Also, I've been streaming for three hours and I'm a little thirsty and I'm a little hungry. So yeah, I think we're going to leave this here, you know, this was Call of Cthulhu RPG Alone Against the Tide. A solitary adventure by the lakeshore. So we had fun, you know. I think we're going to run this module again. And we're possibly going to use the female version of the professor. Maybe she had she has better luck, you know. It was a good run, you know. This is like how mo most of Call of Cthulhu things, uh, you know, end up. So don't feel bad. You usually die. What are we doing tomorrow? Tomorrow we are chilling, you know. We're just chilling. So don't worry. So yeah, um, that's going to be it for the stream. I hope you enjoyed it. That's it for now. See you next time.